What's up my fellow ambitious poker players and welcome to the Mechanics of Poker podcast in which me, Rene, aka The Wacko and Adam Carmichael deconstruct high stakes poker players, figuring out what it is about them, how they think, what they do that makes them so successful with an extra focus on the obstacles they faced and the skills they had to develop to surpass them. This podcast is brought to you by Poker Ambition. If you are ambitious about making more progress in your poker career, go over to their site, pokerambition.com and find out which service is best for you. But without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Hi there, my fellow ambitious poker players, and welcome back to another episode of the Mechanics of Poker podcast, episode nine. And in today's episode, our guest lives a life that I'm sure many of you might envy. He travels around the world while staying at the nicest places, eating at the nicest places. He gambles for a lot of money. He loves to party and he's often accompanied by beautiful women. No, we're not talking about Dan Bolzerian. Would be great to have him on in the future, but for now, no. But we're talking about the French poker superstar Johan Jovural Gilbert. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Especially over the last year, he has gained worldwide popularity when making his appearance in the high roller scene, in which he managed to cash over $1.5 million so far. However, he has more experience playing cash games in which he plays up to 500 1K. So that is like a 500 is a small blind, 1,000 is the big blind. So that makes it what? 100K and L or something. Those are insane stakes. Those are some serious stakes. And as always, that didn't happen over time, guys. It took him over 10 years to reach these stakes. I personally met him around six years ago while he was actually trying to hit on my wife in the jacuzzi of my local gym. Luckily, he was not that convincing and I managed to celebrate my nine-year anniversary yesterday. I'm very really curious to hear because over these last six years, especially he made a lot of progress and I'm very curious to hear his story. Uh, did you know Johan before, Adam? I heard of him recently in the high stakes circles. And I know he's got a very popular YouTube channel and his Instagram's really big as well. But yeah, I don't know too much about his story. So yeah, I'm really curious to hear his background. I know he was a bit of a gamer growing up and he had a lot of success in different games. So yeah, I'm really curious to know how he's managed to blow up, especially the last few years. I'm curious to know what changed the last one or two years for him to really go viral with his kind of content, but also uh, playing the higher stakes games and have a lot of success there. So yeah, really looking forward to bringing out his story and his journey to where he is now. Yeah, I share a similar curiosity. So without further ado, let's have Johan on. All right, there he is. Johan's live from Bodrum in Turkey. Johan, ça va? Ça va, René. I'm good, I'm good, thanks. I'm vacation last day before going to, to Monaco, Monte Carlo for a European poker tour. 10 days of grind from tomorrow, yeah. Uh, I decided to go to Bodrum in Turkey. I've never been there. It's it's a bit uh, the Monaco, let's say, the Monte Carlo of Turkey. Monte very Carlo nice of Turkey, views. I've never been. It's like very nice views. It's really similar to Monte Carlo views with like like some some mountain, not very high, but like uh, the sea and some mountain behind. And uh, and it's a bit like between Santorini and uh, Monaco, let's say, uh, but in Turkey. Okay. Really yeah. beautiful uh, spots. You you do this quite often because you travel around. Do you often take like a little short no. vacation before I should do a grind like the EPT or something? Yeah, I should do more. Actually, I don't do that often. I I should uh, I will do more and more of that because I think it's good balance for because those those grind like especially when you play high rollers and stuff. It's like quite intense because like uh, of course. You can swing a large amount in in USD, so so I think uh, having a, a balance with uh, some real vacation without uh, playing at all, it's uh, it's uh, and doing completely other stuff than than what you do when you are like on the poker circuit, like uh, like a, a proper hotel and and and, and beach or stuff uh, that that I'm I'm not willing to do often because maybe I'm, I get too bored by by those things but uh, I think sometimes to force myself to have a rest like it's the case now it's uh, it's not a bad thing 
I think it's also good to clear your mind, right? I think we all know that if you spend a lot of time in poker, sometimes you want yeah. to progress more and more information is not, is not necessarily the solution, right? You need to just take a step back and let that information process to create sort of some space for new information again, feel motivated again. Probably you're excited now to play poker again after doing nothing. After doing nothing, exactly. After doing two weeks of... Uh, I've traveled in Bucharest, Belgrade and uh, Bodrum. So I've traveled two weeks for pure parties or vacation. So definitely not playing poker since two weeks since uh, Cyprus uh, high roller. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm hyped up again. Like it's... Poker is always like that. Like I can play 12... I played... It's been 12 years I play poker. 13 years, 13 years I play poker, uh, 12 years professionally, and it has always been the same in uh, in a certain way uh, that I, I love the game. Every time I love the game, I can play it like straight eight months in a row like I did recently, eight months straight without breaks. Uh, but there is, a, uh, there is a point where you enjoy less the grind when you do that too much. And when you when you put in between some vacations, some sometimes off for yourself, then then the grind uh, becomes again super um, enjoyable because you you really uh, I don't know you really miss poker and then you want to to go back to it you know and and before having too much of it you you go vacation again or you go somewhere and do something else again and if you do if you do that you can I think you can play for life this game because. It's really an interesting game that is uh, that can take you every day, uh, longer longer hours, and you see you still enjoy it. But you you still have to keep in mind that it's important to to add some uh, small breaks that will make you enjoy more the grind. And the more you enjoy the grind, the better you play also, because the more you enjoy, the better you you give yourself. Uh, like the the more close to your A game you play, basically. Because we are not bots, we, we remain humans. So even if you have like, you study a lot the game or you have like the perfect strategy and stuff, you will deviate from the the, the, the strategies by by your mood and your mental. This is it has to be like that. Like you will you will increase your frequencies. You will you will change many things by uh, um, because of your mood. So you need to treat your mood and your mental uh, as an asset to play your a game yeah that's this this is uh yeah i i, I think this is key for yeah, especially and, for and breaks I, I, contribute I, I, right what break breaks breaks, breaks breaks will contribute to that yeah they contribute and also balance with uh i think sexual life and uh and uh, relationships with friends um so because many poker players they they are really too much alone and it happened to me also and i i guess it's uh because our game is uh, is a individual sport and uh, it takes so much time, it's very time consuming. So we tend to negligate our uh, um, relationships uh, or to have less relationship with people. And uh, also uh, there is a time so where you burn out because of uh, of the lack of relationship with people. So it always uh, it's also an asset to to add a relationship more like true uh, relationship to your life, which is not easy because it takes time to like for someone who wants, for example, a wife or children or family or someone who wants like really uh, friend, be friends with, with people you can trust and everything like trust needs to be built, um, uh, like friendship needs to be built and it takes time uh, out, like the time where you build those relationships, you, you cannot grind. So basically, you lose money uh, by not grinding, but in a certain way, you create your balance that makes you play more your game for the time you are playing. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's really complex, like because uh, life and poker are so connected, and poker is like so much life consuming and money consuming because in a certain way you play your own uh, bank account. So you 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 basically is the only game where you play with your bank account where you involve your finance. So it's uh, it's really, you involve your finance your, your, all your time and playing 12 hours a day. It's like, who, who work 12 hours a day except uh, some entrepreneurs that uh, they don't need to, they, 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 they choose it also like, like poker players. But yeah, so 
it was a bit random ideas, but like I think it, it speaks to a lot of poker players that listen to your podcast. Oh, for sure. And do that. I mean, Adam has uh, was a professional poker player. I'm obviously a professional poker player, so I'm, I I know exactly what you mean, right? And also, I would say that the, we talked about this, I think, in the pod before as well. The person who you need to become or who you need to be in order to be very successful at the poker tables is not necessarily the person that leads to most success in a relationship, right? You have to kind of switch, you know, turn your emotions a little bit off, be a little bit more cold, whereas in relationship, we want to be a little bit more warm, for example. Yeah. So going, uh, uh, you talked about the beautiful game and how uh, uh, how the way that the money is involved also makes it very interesting. You, you mentioned uh, in our questionnaire that already, I think from a very young age, you were in touch with games. Uh, uh -huh. you played chess since you were five years old. How did you get uh -huh. in touch with chess at that age? And what was it about chess that you liked more than, for example, I at that age was probably building sandcastles, right? Why were you at the chess tables and not building sandcastles like me, for example? <laughs> no, I was watching uh, also the... the, the cartoons and stuff but uh, of course uh, I, I i i start uh, discovering chess at five years old because my grandfather was playing uh, uh, the sunday when we were spending time to the, the the grandfather and grandmother they 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 were always having uh, some chess game between uh, like let's say my grandfather and some of my uncles and, and i was watching them and i wanted to, to play as a child because it's like it, it's a game so it looks like uh, friendly for a child and uh, and so I, I, I learned the rules uh, I guess like the rules are not too complicated to understand then then I, I could play so I went uh, they put me at six years old in a club club for children where they play chess so it's a club where you basically play chess on Saturday afternoon with a professor uh, teacher so yeah, I played competitively in uh, from uh, from that age. Uh, those like children competition, and I came maybe second in my region. Region is like uh, I don't know. There is like fifty of those in France. I think uh, region like it's how can I say in English? I think it's region the world. Yeah, region. Uh, yeah. yeah, region like second of my region, which is Lorraine, uh, at age nine. So I qualify for the French championship, which were like the three first of. All the, uh, of every region of France, and I came like mid, uh, mid, uh, in the middle, like maybe forty or something, or forty or fifty plays. So. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was playing uh, for competition uh, at some point, quite hard because I was playing. Uh, I was having like lessons on Wednesdays, Saturdays. I have a, I was having tournament every Sunday with a team. So you, you move city with a team of uh, adults, actually. But I was playing at nine years old with the adults and beating, of course, many of them, but uh, that were not professional, of course, and I was not professional also. But uh, so, but I was playing in an in a adult team um, on Sundays and I had, I had like another two private coaching um, on uh, two other nights, uh, evenings of the week. So that was my 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 routines when I was uh, young because my I think my father was a a, a competitor in uh, in t uh, t table tennis. He was at uh, his young age first French player and then as an adult uh, top ten. And uh, so I guess he he wanted me also to to perform in something that I liked and I, I really liked chess. So I I think he he helped me to at that time to to perform by by understanding that the coaching was uh, was uh, was key uh probably that helped me later on with poker to understand that when you want to perform and and be good at something like uh, you need to get coached by by people who made it before that sounds quite logic but most of people under underestimate the value of being coached so yeah that was really good. Uh, I, I just quit at 10 years old because I was <laughs> burned out, I guess. As a child, I wanted to to watch more Pokemons or stuff, you know, than to play uh, competitively again. And for, maybe you don't manage your emotions very good as a child. I was, like, very sad to have lost, not finish first of the competition in France or something. And 
and just give up. You give up way more as a child, I guess, than than as, as an adult. So yeah, I kind of give up, and then uh, I never played chess again except maybe twenty times in my life since then, in, in the last twenty or thirty years. So I'm probably really bad. But it was a very interesting game. I was one thousand seven hundred elo uh, for people who play chess at nine years old, which is uh, decent, I think. But for 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 my age at the time. Um, I don't know how they use uh, classification nowadays, but it was called ELO, E L O, and I was 1,690, I think, at my maximum uh, in, uh, uh, yeah, in slow games, I think, the two hours per people or one hour, I don't remember exactly, one hour 30 per people. When it was getting so competitive, did you then notice that you started to enjoy it less? Uh, Mm, no, maybe I I start getting more emotional about it in a, in a, in the one way and the other. Like let's say when I was winning, I I was getting way more involved and way more emotional about it and way more uh, yeah excited. And when I was losing, same thing. You know, it's probably the case when you you go in competition in any of the things and versus playing for fun or playing just regularly but with not too much uh, uh important stuff like or well, with not too many uh yeah uh important stuff yeah i think yeah. also the more time we invest in something the more it starts to become part of our identity so you have Johan and you have Johan the chess player and at some point if you just spend so much time those things kind of fade and then if it's Johan the chess player who loses the chess tournament it also transitions a bit to into Johan his personal life right i'm it's not like you on the chess player field, but it's like, oh, I field now as well. It start, this is what you said. You you start to have more trouble dividing these things emotionally. Oh, yeah. Oh, and I think in poker, it's even more the truth. I think in poker, mm-hmm. it's definitely uh, like every poker player that do that for a living or even I think those who, who do that like really, really often, they, they have the same feeling as the people who do it for a living. Like we definitely are the same the same person um, in poker and outside of poker. I mean, like it's, it's, we think about poker even in real life always. And, and it's really one, one entity. I, 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 I never divide uh, poker and, uh, and me. I think it's, it has always been one entity. I also would confess that I never divide uh, my life bankroll and my uh, poker bankroll. So, I, for me, it's all in one. It has always been all in one. Uh, doesn't mean that I'm all in or something. It just means that I, I, I consider my bankroll as my, uh, my, my, all my savings. So I'm definitely the, the kind of, of person that is uh, not making a separation between uh, poker and, uh, and uh, my life. Yeah. I don't know if it's good or bad. I think even if you avoid to make if you try to make separation and everything when you play at a high level or something you it's almost impossible to make a separation i guess like it's it's going to be better to accept i guess and that is one thing and uh to try to optimize optimize optimize, optimize it the maximum at the at the best i guess it's the same for a tennis player or something um i think i don't know exactly but I think it also depends on where you are in your career. I can imagine if you start out that it's way more important, right? Because also how much you spend, how much you earn will influence the life that you have. But for example, at this phase that you're now in your career, you can kind of merge the two because one will not have a drastic impact on the other in the short term. Yeah. Yeah. When you're Um, at the beginning, it's even more important, I guess, first year, especially of your career and stuff when you start going pro. Yeah. Yeah, that in the beginning, it's very important to deal your finance as well. Speak from personal experience in the, in making mistakes in that area that has huge yeah. compound effects. So yeah. everyone listen, be smart with your money in, earlier in your career. Uh, transitioning into chess, you also mentioned that you later went into playing video games. If I'm not mistaken, you wrote down that you ranked number one in 40K Dawn of War. And you also participated in the World Cyber Games, which I assume is sort of the world series of online gaming. Uh, Again, just like with chess, uh, you took it quite serious, right? Uh, Mm. 
is there what is there about you doing something that you want to get very good at is that something you do consciously is that unconsciously yeah uh well i think when when i like the a strategy game or something and i i let's say i have friends or people uh that i know uh very good that that like the same game let's say for chess was my family and for for down of four was a uh, few uh few friends um I want first to beat them, so that's that's a tendency that I notice in me. Uh, once I beat them, I want uh, I want to beat the other people that are that I don't know yet that are good in the game. Uh, so yeah, I I try to improve in the game uh, and put many hours into it and think a lot about it. Uh, try to consume the maximum content about the game and the strategy of the game. That's what I did with Down of War. Uh, Down of War is basically the. Have you ever known the the, the figurines that you paint, the the little Warhammer that you paint, and no, those are like oh. you can buy in shop. Basically, you uh, you use like some glue, super glue. You you can put them uh, all together because they are like in pieces, you know. And then once you put them all together, you have to paint them. Okay. Um, then you can use them to play uh, on a on a table where you put like ah. fake grass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you put like fake grass on the table, and this fake grass is like you buy in shops also. And you put like some houses and 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 whatever. Like you can make a, a your own uh, land. Okay. On that land, uh, you bring your army that you paint already, and the other guy bring his army. That he, he, he painted uh, already. Mm -hmm. So this army is used. Um, so it's a game where you play uh, um, like chess. You know, like one has to choose his decision, then it's the other one. It's one round, round, round by round. It's not in real time. You know, uh, and games are approximately three, four hours. One mm -hmm. heads up. Uh, and the book of the rules of the game is like that big. You know, it's like a really complex game. Every unit that you have has different power and different weapon. And for example, to touch your opponent, you use a meter. Like for example, this unit can shot up to like let's say 30 centimeters. So if you know your unit is 30 centimeters away from an opponent unit, then you can shot them. Then you use dice. So there is a bit of uh, variance because for example, one unit has maybe six uh, soldiers. So you use six dice, and they have like precision, let's say like uh, for um, like fifty percent. Then it's if it's four, five, or six, then you hit the 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 the, ah, okay. the opponent. Do you understand? If it's like one, two, or three, then you you missed. So mm -hmm. um, every unit, some units have like eighty percent precision, you know, and. And 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 they, then there is damage and everything, damage and everything. So it's like really complex, but it's really interesting. It's uh, it's actually very strategic. It's a lot of uh, macro, macro, a lot of macro. Uh, so this is the game on the um, not. It's not a video game at the beginning. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. It still exists. There is competition all around the world. It's called Warhammer. So it is a Warhammer battle, which is like the mm -hmm. the people from the medieval uh, age, or mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, Warhammer 40k, which is the futurist uh, Warhammer, the one I was mm -hmm. playing. Basically, I was playing Dark Eldar, and basically Warhammer the 40k is the same game, but in a, on the video game, but in uh, real time. So it's basically uh, like Age of Empire or War uh -huh. of Three or um, Starcraft, you know. So you build <laughs> your uh, units, you build your um, your base, uh, you try to get the map control, and you just basically need to annihilate the opponent. And those heads up are like one versus one are like between I would say ten minutes and one hour for for the longest, but like ten minutes and forty minutes, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I, in this game, I was like maybe top top one at at some point in the world online and. And I played, I participated to World Cyber Game where I, I failed also, <laughs> kind of, because I came like fifth French and I was favorite and stuff. So I, I didn't even qualify for the 
waltzing uh, live in, in the live competition. But online, I was really competitive on that game. And I was uh, between 16 and 18 years old when I was playing that. And uh, the, 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 the figurines one, the, the, the one I described before, I was playing it from age uh, 13 to 16. I was not very competitive in that one. I was playing at a um, region level with, uh, with people from uh, my club and stuff like that. There, is club. There, there are clubs also where you meet people playing that thing all night. Um, yeah, I also right. saw you. Uh, I also saw you played some Magic the Gathering. I also played Play, some same. Magic the Gathering. Not it's like a similar vibe, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was playing Magic also, not very competitive, but with friends and uh, having different decks on period, which was Carnage, uh, Mirodin, and Seven Edition. So that was my ah, period. Yeah, well, it was it was in the same time as me then? Yeah, I remember nice, this. Time. Nice. I had a exact exalted angel deck. Uh, some Cantic, selon Orim, uh, I don't know, it, it, Orim Cantic, I guess, in English, uh, which is an older card that I use with uh, Isaac, Isochronic Scepter or something like that in English. Yeah. Well, people who know magic will understand, but I, I, understand, always, yeah, yeah. I, I always give a lot of details about those games because I guess like when I'm listening to podcasts, uh, I actually like when I know some games that I was playing, I actually happy that the guy the guys are speaking deep about it, you know, like, yeah, I know yeah, yeah. it's more about poker, your channel, but, you know, like, you never know, like, those people, like, many of your uh, viewers, many of our uh, people who follow us, they, they, they definitely played some, some of the games we did, uh, we played, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think th these are all very important experiences that happened in your life that made you the player that you yeah. are today, right? That's why we always find it very interesting to start here uh, when someone has an uh, indeed a history in gaming, for example. So what I really see with you is that you're really driven by the challenge, right? You want to first beat your friends, then you want to see, okay, who's better? Who can I beat? Is that then the fact that your level also rises when you play against other players? Is that a way that you can develop and do you get satisfaction out of seeing yourself getting better? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's that's how I get um, a lot of satisfaction. I think at uh, at um, at uh, ego level, I guess, but also at I become better by um, absorbing the um, uh, trying to understand the mind of the other player that is better than me, for example, and uh, and trying to become uh, to take the best uh, qualities that he has to add them in my game. Um, I I I. I all, always worked in a, in a copy mode. I, I like to copy paste uh, things that, that, that I find on, on people that works, you know, like skills, stuff like that. Uh, nowadays, there, is, uh, there are many other ways to learn, I guess, but when you combine all the, the different um, ways to, that are available to learn, I, I guess uh, you can become like some, some really good, uh, player in, in in any any game does this um does this drive to be challenged also have some negative consequences that you've experienced like being very competitive and always trying to find someone who's better and trying to beat them does it have any negative consequences on your life yeah the negative can be uh can be that you never get really satisfied because uh you get satisfied but it's not really long um, it doesn't last really long because there is always someone that is better. So um, basically, there is always another competition where players are more competitive than you, and uh, so it's really rare, I guess, to be not uh, to be really satisfied. I guess uh, when you are like that, because you <laughs> you just get satisfied basically if you are the best of the world. I think, and even even if you you to stay the best of the world, I think you you have. I've never been the best of the world in any of those games. I've been maybe first in Down of War at, at some point, but maybe for, for a couple of weeks or something. And it was like... Yeah, and that's uh, the thing, right? It's not static. It's not like, okay, you're first now, and you'll be first forever. It takes a couple of weeks yeah. and someone else surpasses you. So it's a... It's, oh, some it's legend. A infinite yeah, 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 that's true. Some legend do, by the way. Some legend, like in, in every of those area, chess, uh, video game, or even poker, they, they stay they stay first of the world admitted by many people or many competitions during many months and even sometimes many years when you when you consider for example michael jordan tiger woods or uh, um, 
I don't know, like uh, uh, Nadal or Djokovic. But still, you know, uh, if you need to be Nadal or Djokovic or Tiger Woods or Michael Jordan to be really fulfilled, then not a lot of people will be fulfilled and uh, yeah. probably will never get fulfilled. Uh, so it's, um, I guess it's a balance where you need to to f- to not get too much frustrated by 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 uh, by those things because then if you get too much frustrated by those things you will never enjoy it. But um, yeah, I, I have this a bit. It 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 makes me frust- frustrated when uh, if I cannot be the best. But of course, uh, it's gonna. When when, when did you realize that this was like a trap? Was there a specific moment in one of your careers in the gaming earlier, or did it come later in poker where you realized, oh fuck, I'm just chasing something that's impossible? I think I just realized now. I think okay. I, I'm, I'm. I think I'm just realizing now uh, at age 33 uh, because of poker. Uh, I think before I didn't realize that. I, I think I was not putting words on that. I, I think it was uh, too too complex to understand at that point. I was just wanting to to be uh, better and better, but I was not putting words. I think I realize now because of experience and because. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, now that I'm I'm playing also I rollers uh, in poker and I playing like hundred k's I played the two fifty in, uh, in in Vegas two hundred fifty k buy in um, it's like I play with the best of the world it's it's insane how much uh, how good they are like they like for me I I have I have a lot of respect for them and I think like when I see some of them I think like I have so much work to do and um, yeah, so it's um, it's that good. motivates I, I, you I, I, now in a more positive way. It's not it, like it's, oh it's shit, positive. they are so far behind. I still have to do that. It's uh, it, you, you, you. The way you said it, there was positivity around it. Like oh, it's wow, mixed. I'm it's really a mix. Expecting. It's positive yeah. and ne- it's positive and negative. It's positive because uh, yes, I use it as a as a as a challenge. As a it drains me to be better. It drives me. It drives me to be better. And it's and the negative part is. Bro, like, when, when does that end? Like, when do you, like, finish the game? When do you finish poker? You basically never finish poker. So that's uh, that's the negative part where you want to finish the thing and you think, like, okay, I will finish the thing. But let's say even the guy who, won, who, who win the main event of the World Series of Poker, because in poker we tend to say, okay, this is the world champion, blah, blah, blah. But this guy is... He doesn't feel like he is the first in the world because he is not. He knows it, and uh, and I guess many people think, oh, if I win the main event of Fort Series, it's game over, GG. It's eight million, GG. But bro, uh, no, you will. First of all, you will you will feel fulfilled during maybe a few days, maybe a few months. Then you will be like, okay, what is next? I want to beat. Uh, those guys uh, in high rollers, and this is completely another competition. Uh, most of the main event champion of World Series, they 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 can't even play high rollers. They they played few of them, and then they give up because they saw it was too competitive for them. Um, so yeah, it. Uh, they, I, I guess they don't get fulfilled because most, if they have this attitude of of wanting to be the best, they they cannot get fulfilled because they feel okay. I I want maybe this big tournament that is recognize in the world uh, or maybe this super it, it can work for online player also if you are like super t- top rank online uh, in cash game uh, then you want to play uh, and to show the world that you are the best but to show the world that you are the best you need to go out of your computer because the world is not watching you on the computer except few of the people that are in the poker world uh, that are in the cash game uh, even not in the poker world like in the cash game specific online cash game world um, so you are like Malinowski and you, you, you just want to play those high rollers. In fact, he played the, those high rollers. He won one of them uh, last year in Cyprus, 250k buy-in. He won it. Um, and probably what drives him is not the tournament uh, format. I think probably he doesn't even like it, um, which most of the cash game players don't. I'm, a, I'm initially a, a, a tournament player then. Long time of my life, I, I used to play cash game, and and then eventually I switch again to tournament. But I'm still playing cash game. But so I, I know uh, exactly what is the feeling of cash game player towards tournaments. Like uh, they hate it most of the time, and they are kind of right. Like this is like a bit bullshit compared to 
to cash game. <laughs> to be honest, I'm a cash game player in, in, in the mind more than the tournament player. Um, it's a bit bullshit because we are too shallow and everything, but there is so much things to know about like shallow stacks and stuff. It's so, so it's, it's really so complex. complex. I, I think if people just say, ah, no, tournaments is, you know, whatever, yeah. they, they haven't went into detail. In my opinion, tournaments is way more complex. It's super complex, but it's also not, uh, I don't know, it's not the same, uh, it's not very interesting compared to, I don't know, for some people it might be more interesting, for some people uh, cash game might be more interesting. I, I really think uh, cash game, especially deep cash game live, uh, it's way more interesting and probably because it fits better my lifestyle uh, of like uh, uh, traveling and just like playing when I want, stopping when I want, playing in nice places and stuff. Probably that's the reason why I, I love so much uh, live cash game, and I guess it's my favorite format by far. No, you um, hear that for online players as well, right? For example, a, a, a online tournament schedule for me would be killing. I like the fact that I can just grind in the day, start whenever I want, stop whenever I want, exactly what you just said, right? Yeah, this is so hard. Online tournament schedule is like so hard. They, they are the most, I respect them the most, I think. I, I, it's, it's, it's so complicated because mentally... Mm, and also what you mentioned, Physically. right? You combine it with your personal life, your relationship. It takes a toll. Yeah, it takes a toll. Tournament, online tournaments are like, wow. I, I did that grind during like maybe three, four years at the beginning. And I, I, I know this is a hustle. This is like so frustrating. So um, so everything at the same time. So I, I guess like w when you want to be the best, uh, you kind of need to go in outside of your comfort zone in some other format that you didn't want to go at the beginning just because to be the best you need to prove the world that you are the best so you need to play what the world wants you to play um, yeah, yeah. which is very very tricky which is very tricky because it's uh it's forced you to to go in areas where you are not the best uh, like, but some people manage to do it, and I have big respect for someone like Malinowski who did it. Okay, did it once on one big tournament, but uh, I'm sure this guy uh, is one of the best of the world. And I like yeah, the fact just that to say, he, like, he hey guys, I, I've done it. You know, there's nothing anymore to prove. Why would I continue? Yeah, and there is still something to prove because. Also, people will say, okay, you did it once, maybe you got lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you need to grind it, you know? Uh, but I, I yeah, I, I, would, I would love to speak with other, like, uh, I speak actually with uh, people, but I would love to speak publicly for uh, super content for, for people who watch uh, YouTube videos uh, about mm -hmm. those things with other, like, world-class champions. But you are one of them, uh, online cash game. So mm -hmm. it's very... Interesting to have your opinion also on, on those uh, no, concepts. Like in, in, in online cash games, for example, I actually know, I think a lot of the ISEX online cash game players also, they actually like it that way. They like the fact that they're in the shadow. They like the fact that no one knows them. Uh, I think that's that's definitely a characteristic that draws them maybe also to, to online cash games instead of live circuit, live tournaments, where I guess there's more of the allure, you know, there's more of the spotlights on you. And some people like that, some people don't. Uh but yeah, if you become very good at online poker, congratulations. There's now maybe 100 people in the world that recognize you as very good. They're probably all male aged between 20 and 35. Congratulations. That is your external validation to your career, basically, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, it's not like, you know, I, you walk out of your apartment and there's girls throwing their panties at you. You're not a rock star. For that, you would probably have to enter the live scene. <laughs> not even uh, you're not you're not becoming a rock star uh, in in poker ever. Like uh, if you want to be a rock star, like there is no way in poker. Like because it's not mainstream enough. And maybe if you become like Phil Elmuth or Negrano, it can be a little close to it, but really um, still really far. Because like for example, like most of the women don't even watch poker. Yeah, so exactly, men that will be behind you and stuff. Oh no, yeah, the, the YouTube analytics of this channel tell me one percent of my watchers is female. Yeah, this is exactly the the statistics. It's between one and uh, up to five six percent. So yeah, 
we, we made quite, we made actually quite a big leap because we were talking about gaming and then at some point you transitioned into poker you mentioned i think you went tournaments then you played cash games for a long time then tournaments the first time you entered the casino you played poker and you mentioned that you were hooked right you said you played the the 40k dump between 16 and 18 so i guess at some point you were 18 you could enter the casino you tried it out you got hooked instantly what was it about did did you see certain similar mechanics to the other games that you could transition into poker that made you successful straight away from the beginning or was it uh, no no i was, was not successful from the beginning no no i was not successful from the beginning i even lost at the beginning in poker i lost uh, uh i i basically lost everything that i had on the side but i was 20 years old so i had not a lot on the side those are the i lost basically the money you know the money that you you get when you have like your birthday and when you are like all your childhood, maybe like a family give a little bit every time and you basically put that money on the side on a, on a uh-huh. bank account that is supposed to be some bank account that you use to start in life or something. So, so let's you, say- You said to start in poker. <laughs> yeah. So I basically, it was 3000 euro uh, in total and I lost in three months this money. So uh, in uh, life. I, I was not playing online. It was oh, okay. in, uh, you were playing in Paris. Live mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, live. I was playing live cash game. Actually, everything live uh, tournament also. Like I mean, like the tournament. There was like a thirty euro tournament in the morning, uh, in Aviation Club de France in Paris. It's in the Champs Elysees. It was like one of the places that most of the poker players have been. It's closed since many years now. Three open under another name, um, but basically this is like. Uh, the place I was going every day when I was a radio, I was a radio DJ at the time in Paris. So I was not earning a lot. Like I was earning like around 1,200 euro a month. Uh, and I was going to the live uh, circle, uh, circle de poker, we say. And it's uh, playing the tournament on the morning, 30 euro playing cash game blind 2-2, which was the smallest table. Uh, blind 2-2, so NL200, but I was playing with 50 euro, which was the minimum, so 25 blind. Um, yeah, I was basically trying to apply at the beginning this uh, strategy that I found online. I, I type on Google about short stack strategy and, and just like it, it shows you how to like you play 10s plus and just like ace queen, ace king, just shoving basically over a raise. And when there is a raise, you, you need to fold ace queen. <laughs> Like and when there is no raise, you can open a raise with this queen. Uh, it was some 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 stuff like that, like really nitty and 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 it worked actually because I was like just folding during hours and just like shoving over a raise. Sometimes like there, there was a raise and and like three three calls like every time and then you end up winning money by doing that. You wreck really little. Um, so yeah, it, it was working and I, I made probably few hundred euro like that like probably five six hundred euro starting every time from 50 euro and if i would have continued that for sure i would have made a bit of money but definitely then you you watch some other content and you don't understand anything at poker at strategy so you just don't understand every concept and you just basically watch poker after dark with tom Duan and ivy and then you see that po- that Tom Duan three bet six four suited, you know, and make a straight, you know. Yeah, Tom Duan doesn't play ace queen, doesn't fold ace queen to a race. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, and like three bet six four suited and make a straight and and take so much like a two hundred k pot or three hundred k pot, and you are like, maybe I should open up a bit, you know, like this is <laughs> you understand? You don't, you don't and get that's why you lost your bag, bro. And that's how I lost the 3k. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's how because because I start, I thank start, you, Tom Duan. <laughs> thank you, Tom Duan. I start, which I played with uh, recently in Vegas. That's fun because after all those years, I finally play with Tom Duan in cash game uh-huh. and in the same tournament also. But uh, it's very fun, you know. Like uh, and um, no, I was basically don't under, I, I was like, of course, I start flatting. Eight nine three did and, and uh, fifty euro deep in in two two in middle position against uh, a seven x open another gun. So yeah, of course I couldn't win money like that. So I just basically lost three k like that, which make me realize that I cannot 
definitely continue because first I have no money to continue. <laughs> Second, uh, I, I, I'm not a gambler addict or something. So I, I, I definitely don't, don't want to become one. So I start buying book about poker at that time. And uh, my first book was Kill Elki, uh, the book of Elki, which is my good friend now. And thanks to that book at that time, it was really good, definitely. And I definitely uh, made back my money in like a couple months and uh, then uh, start uh, winning. And I, I won like, I was in profit of 10K euro after six months. Uh, so like in three months, I lost 3K. Then I ended up being uh, recovering my 3K in like two or three months. And then, and then I was winning another 10K in like a few months after. And I was deciding to quit radio. I decided to quit radio, uh, um, which was not paying a lot, just to make poker my, my full-time activity. And I moved to, from Paris to Cagliari in Sardinia because I'm 50% Italian from Sardinia, actually. But I wanted to see my origins. Uh, I wanted to learn Italian because my parents, everybody always speak to me in French. So I never learned Italian. So I learned there. I was play Also, I wanted to play lower stakes because... I start to understand about strategy of poker. So I start to understand that I, with my bankroll, I cannot play uh, like not even like 2-2 two, two in life because it can be too risky. So with my expenses and stuff, I, I, I had probably four, 4K bankroll or something, you know? So 4,000 or, 4, or 3,500 bankroll, uh, I cannot play 2-2. I two, two. Uh, cannot play, pay a rent and, and just expect to, to do good in Paris. So I went to Sardinia, rent were cheaper, um, live games, and I was playing, I was not playing online, so live games were cheaper also, I could play 25, 50 cents, so NL50 in live with dealer, uh, NL100 also, and tournaments where like, there were, were sitting goes in the live um, um, room in, a, in Cagliari, where I was playing sitting go of 20 euro, 30 euro, uh, 50 euro, and sometimes there was 100 euro sitting go start. So with nine player or 10 player, Top three paid. Uh, I was grinding the sit and goes. I was grinding the the cash game after the sit and goes. I was grinding the 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 live tournament that they had like every day, like fifty euro, thirty euro buying with rebuy or stuff. And I was grinding those things, probably making two k a month at the time, uh, playing every day. By the way, so it was a uh, very poor hourly, but with a lot of wreck, because those rooms have a lot of wreck, like probably a twenty percent wreck or something. Uh, I was still a big winner, probably the biggest winner in that room. Uh, but uh, yeah, then I, I, I moved to online, I switched to online and I continue to play live, but really less compared to online during uh, the next five years. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you want to know the details, but basically... No, I I, 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 let, let, me, let me ask one thing and then okay. I'm sure Adam also has a lot of questions uh, yeah. that he would like to ask you. Uh, my last question uh, before I give it over to Adam. Uh, when you started to finally, you read the book of Elki, you read a couple of things that made a lot of sense to you. I know that he's also a gamer, right? He came from StarCraft, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, were there then things when you started to think about poker for yourself with the help of this book, trying to prove, were there then certain skills that you developed during your gaming history that you could then use in poker? Did you see certain similarities in how certain games work compared to how poker works? Did that help you any sort of way? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I start um, noticing that poker was way more complex than what I expected. I thought it was way more simple than that. Mm -hmm. So I, I start to understand that it was as, as probably as complex as chess and as uh, Warhammer and stuff, which I didn't even think before I thought hmm, this game is not that complex it's just like few strategies a lot of luck and GG so I thought poker was like that and I think many people think like that actually many people who are not pro of course many people who are like in the journey of poker and that's why they don't take coaching actually that's why they don't pay for courses uh, because they don't see they, the, the depth of the game. They're like, then what's the exactly. point? You're not going to give me anything extra. That's why they think coaches are scammers also. Because poker coach. Because they don't see the deepness of the game. And it's normal. They cannot. It's so complicated to see the deepness of the game before. So you don't. You think you can find everything on YouTube. Because you're like, 
what the fuck? Like the guy is just a coach of poker. It's like there is nothing to coach about. Like there is maybe like don't play this end, don't play this end, and play this end, play this end, raise big and GG, you know. But so basically, when I start understanding that it was so much complex that there is like every stack size, uh, different strategy that. Uh, every position, uh, different ranges, uh, post flop, you can use different line. Um, that basically you will make way more money by doing that instead of that. And uh, when I understood those things, I, I, I was like, okay, this is a game for me, and I will, I will, I will, I will try to, to master it. Um, yeah, your question is more about like what did I notice specifically that make me understand right uh, uh what 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 kind of for example did you see similarities in for example mm. the way you approach strategy in the other games compared to poker that gave you a certain advantage that helped you understand the game better given your history yeah yeah so the main thing that i, I noticed is especially on post flop game is like if you can if you can think what the the other person has in mind because all the people, especially at the time, were playing exploit strategies. So there was no GTO or stuff. So if you can just know what he's thinking and what he's gonna do before he's actually doing it, then you have like a big edge on him. And that's the same in um, Down of War or in chess. It's like if you can anticipate the move of the people, the next move of the people of the person then you have a big edge. And if you can understand what he think, how he think, so what he think about your move, how is, what, what he think about uh, what, you, what he thinks you're gonna do. If you know what he thinks you're gonna do, then you can do another thing that he didn't expect. But for that, it's just like, basically you need to, yeah, I, I, I was very good at brain, uh, at braining my opponents basically, at understanding before, they will do something, what they will do, and at understanding um, what he thinks I'm gonna do and doing something else. So just with those competence, I guess, I could already do money. I was not studying the game much. I was playing, 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 playing. Playing and, then stu and studying indirectly, right? You saw people make certain moves, you gain information, we're like, yeah. oh, you do this because of that. And then you could kind of predict what was going on. You could maybe yeah. induce certain lines, avoid certain yeah. lines. Make my auto analyze after the game, make uh, my re um, re reviewing my own hands, especially um, after a live uh, session. Like I was going home and I was always making my, my auto analyze. It, it takes sometimes two hours. I was taking every end in my, because I had every end that I played, like every big, big pot that I played in my, in my head. So I was remaking, uh, making again that end and say, okay, what could I have done differently? What, uh, why it was a success that end? Why it was a fail that end? Why, why I lost that end? Or why I lost, but I think I played good. Uh, I basically was analyzing if I played good or bad every end. And I, and I was thinking if there was another possibility to play it better, to play every yeah. end better. So that's studying in a certain way, but... And you probably I, I, did the same in the other games you played, right? You used the same yeah. tactic in order to improve. Like you same, analyze yeah. your games. Yeah. Same thing. Same thing. Probably this is my, my main method since forever, I guess. Uh, I probably use too much of this method. Uh, even, uh, I need to add more uh, different methods, but uh, I still have different methods. I, use, I still use coaching. I still uh, I, I, I watch still uh, video, strategic video of... Uh, of uh, top pros, um, I still uh, I use a bit of solver, but I definitely need to use more of all those things uh, because I, I I'm, I'm always uh, capitalizing on that uh, method that uh, that we just talked about, and it's not enough. If you if you if you capitalize ninety percent of your uh, study effort on on with with that method, you you will you will you will be limited and capped. So this is basically, yeah, how I did um, at the beginning. This podcast is brought to you by Poker Ambition, where me and Adam have created our coaching program, The Mechanics of 
poker. After having reached high stakes poker ourselves, we tested out this philosophy on our CFP students, which saw them rise through the ranks and double their win rate. We then took the best knowledge of that CFP program and turned it into the mechanics of poker so you can have that high quality content without the long-term commitment and often hefty price that comes with a CFP program. Now I will be teaching you the technical side of how poker really works, how to think about the game and how to consistently get better. And Adam focuses on the mindset and performance skills you need to know in order to convert all that technical poker knowledge into more consistent profits at the table. Now this program is high level. It's made for professional poker players who have the ambition to break free from mid stakes and move up to high stakes poker. So if you're ambitious about your poker goals, go over to pokerambition.com for more information. And there you can also find a free one hour demo of everything that is inside the program. If you have any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out. But without further ado, let's get back to more goodness in this episode. Uh, Adam, sorry you have been so silent on the sidelines that I've excluded you. People are like, isn't this a co-host podcast? Where is Adam? Adam is sitting silently on the sidelines. Adam, I'm sure you uh, you have a lot to ask. I have. I've been enjoying the stories. It's been great listening to all of them so far. Hey, yeah, I've got a, hi, 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 John. I've got 100 yeah, places I can dive in at, but I'd like to dive in around this kind of transition point from yeah, your kind of gaming background to going into poker. I think it's very interesting where I'm guessing going into poker, you probably had quite a big ego. You've a chess prodigy, one of the top players in your country. You've went into other games and world almost like got a world ranking in these other games. And then you've gone to poker. And like you said, you you went in with the kind of pretense that it's not that complex. So when you did start playing poker, were you a bit surprised by the complexity? And did you have a big ego going into poker that you needed to, to work through? Yeah. yeah, very, very, very good read. Uh, yeah, 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 I had the... Uh... I have too much. I had too much of a big ego. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I was um, basically spewing like a monkey uh, because I just wanted to to own the people that I had no like fundamentals, and uh, I was just wanting to to be the best in the room uh, very quick in the process. But I got destroyed. Uh, those three k euro I speak about basically, but it's it doesn't look like a lot of of money of money because it's I was playing two two. But like I was, I was playing them 50 euro by 50 euro, you know, 100 euro by 100 euro, and actually I lost them uh, by doing completely random shit. Uh, and also after when I start winning and being a winning player, I was still spewing a lot. Of course, I was uh, could have been a way a bigger winning player if I was not making those spew. I start um, buying in 100 deep instead of 25 deep. And um, and yeah, I, I start trying to outplay without really um, knowledge about, uh, um, but like uh, not a lot of knowledge. So I was, it was a lot of intuition, a lot of uh, trying to do unconventional thing, but like way too much unconventional. So if I was seeing uh, people doing, like let's say I was analyzing the best people in the room um, that were always always the same reg, like. The regs of the of that club, uh, and I was trying to see what they do, and I was I wanted to be uh, completely another um, another style. I wanted to be the the player that will own them, uh, playing a complete other style, and wanted to be remain uh, re reminded as someone that is not understandable, not readable, um, and that is very difficult to play against. Uh, which is based effectively uh, exactly on ego, and it's not uh, the best way to to win money in poker. Uh, nowadays, someone like Adamo, uh, Michael Adamo, that I play a lot in uh, in those uh, high rollers since I play them, um, is playing, uh, let's say, way more unconventional than most of the regs. Actually, I would say. Uh, he's getting reminded and everything, but he has like a lot. He study a lot, and he's doing stuff that are solver approved many times. Uh, where um, so it's it's he gets reminded by being good, basically uh, reminded by being good. Uh, where I was like uh, 
reminded by being a monkey. <laughs> so yeah, I'm still a bit of a monkey uh, nowadays. Uh, it's it's never changed on that, but like, I'm uh, of course I have way more strategies and and way more deepness in my game uh, that I can um, that I can uh, manage to to make good money out of this game. But uh, compared to, I have. Uh, like, I have still those tendencies to be some uh, somehow uh, someone that try to probably by ego, but that try to be different um, in my uh, my style. Um, yeah, or do something that is not conventional. Yeah, so it sounds like your ego took a, a big hit quite early on when you lost that three thousand, which was your your life yeah. role coming into poker. Yeah, what was it like playing a game for money at that time? Because obviously before that you played chess, you played the games. But there's no money on the line. So you just had to beat your opponents and you almost had an unlimited sample size to get good at those games without too much repercussions. But all of a sudden, poker's bleeding you out. You've lost 3K. You haven't got much more to go for. How was the dynamics of playing for money? Did you enjoy the adrenaline or did it create pressure in the short term? Yeah, it, it created a lot of pressure, actually. I, I, fe I feared uh, I feared uh, when I realized that it was a game that could involve uh, that much... Uh, uh, finances and, and stuff like say yeah it's first time you that's why poker is uh, is insane um, and that's why poker you cannot uh, you cannot dissociate your person and uh, the poker you cannot go like uh, okay today I'm gonna play poker like it's a hobby or something it's just like so much in, in, into you because of the money uh, that is uh, in line so yeah no I was fearing actually because I'm 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 a bit risk averse, actually. I have a lot of, uh, in micro, let's say, my micro, if I have to say, in video games, we speak about micro gestion, micro gestion and macro. Uh, I don't know if it's the same term in English. I think, yes. Yeah, micro, is. you know? Yeah, you know what yeah. is it, right? Yeah, micro and macro, yeah. Okay, so my micro, okay, for some people who don't know, we're going to define micro. How do you define micro and, and macro for people who don't, don't know what we are talking about? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's macro, the kind of broader concepts, and micro is like the more in-depth, more the, the zoomed-in version. So, for example, macro of the weather is all the seasons, whereas the micro would be the summertime or the winter time. So it's like a, a building into bricks. That's the way I would think about it. Okay, I like it. And I would define it in poker. I would say maybe the micro in poker would be hand by hand, like uh, one poker hand. The macro will be your bankroll management, uh, the, um, the, the, the table selection. The, some macro concept will be the how you basically use your time uh, to study the game, uh, stuff like that, that make you win more money at the end, basically. Uh, and micro decision are the decision that you're gonna like. Why I'm gonna take this line on the river instead of this line? What I'm, what uh, what I'm gonna do pre flop in that spot? This is more micro decision. So I I have I've always been in uh, in um, in life and in a video game more of a macro uh, guy. Uh, I think uh, I have more qualities for macro than for my micro. So macro with an A um, is more my thing. So basically, I would go crazy in micro, uh, and I would almost never go crazy in macro. Uh, so I would take a lot of risk in in uh, in the hands or yeah, in specific hands or in lines, and I would not take any risk almost in uh, in uh, bankroll management or in uh, in. Uh, in using my time correctly, in, in I will not go mad, I will not go crazy, I will not do things that I will regret in life or something. I will be always like kind of disciplined uh, on the overall uh, on my overall schedules and stuff. So I was uh, yeah, I was fearing when I, I re realized that poker was uh, was a lot. Uh, uh, touching my macro. Uh, when it was touching my macro, I was, uh, this is too much for me. Now I cannot take any risk anymore. I would never put money again in poker except um, except the money that I will win, that that I would have won in poker. So basically I, I was, I just put a bit, I start winning back my, 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 my money. Uh, I start making 10K profit. And then I was like, okay, if, if I lose my bankroll again, 
I'm gonna be done with this game. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take another shot uh, to use uh, money of uh, of a work of a hard work or something to to play poker. So I was willing to give up actually uh, at the beginning, uh, but I didn't add to. Um, and uh, yeah, then I, I managed pretty good. Let's say my step by step career overall i would say uh, by ch- by gaming uh, by the choice of the format that i played in the in the good timings i think i i played online cash games when people were saying it's too late but actually it was uh, still very profitable especially on dot fr and dot italy that's where i was playing french sites and italian sites um it was 2013 14 15 and a bit of 16 so that's where I made probably uh, somewhere around 2.5 million hands. Uh, and one after rec back and everything like around five, 500, 550k. So I use, instead of continuing on online cash game, I moved to live cash game at a period where people were saying, this is not a format that you can grind. So I moved to live cash game in 2000, end of 2015 in Las Vegas. There were only American regs and fish. Um, there were no online regs. So people were way behind the online level that I, uh, that I got uh, at the time. So I start winning pretty big in those, uh, like I make my first six figure months in, uh, in Vegas in those 2550 game which was the biggest, there were not too much big games in Hold'em at that time, uh, like regular game. So, yeah, I think I choose pretty smartly my formats. And nowadays, uh, I'm choosing formats that are like either really big games in cash game, where there is a lot of uh, uh, money uh, on the table um, with different kind of profile. There are VIPs, um, businessmans, uh, and also some very solid reg. Uh, and so I'm getting uh, also invited to more games than uh, than most of the pros, I would say, um, because I give action also, because I, yeah, I, I, I don't think I play conventional. So that's, that's probably one of the reasons and people can make good money on me uh, in, in, in in some hands, uh, but good for them. I, I will give them action. I mean, like uh, recently, I my last two big ends were 200k pot. Uh, I I 5-bet jam pre-flop. So may, maybe that's one of the reasons I get invited. I don't know. Like, I know I'm, uh, I have this crazy, I do those crazy things and it's like, it's like that. I, 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 I if I think he's bluffing me, I'm, I'm going to put the trigger, pull the trigger. So I was wrong uh, many times in my career, <laughs> in micro, let's say in micro, but overall in macro, how I manage my, my overall career and shoes of, of uh, formats and stuff, I, I made good decisions that lead me to where I am now, able to play uh, my all action in, in, in 100Ks and, and, and that's, what I, that's what I do. But uh, also those high rollers are very tough. Um, even uh, if uh, they they are very tough, so I think I have a lot of work to do to be able to 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 one day uh, to one day uh, uh, succeed very hard on those high rollers. So uh, this is maybe not my um, the format that I, I I was the most smart to choose. Uh, it's more because I like competition, I like challenge. So now I'm I'm giving a try. I'm willing to give a try. If I lose few millions, um, then maybe I will give up that format. But uh, if I don't lose few millions, maybe I'm gonna stay. You know. So I'm I'm basically in that phase of my career where I'm uh, playing big cash games and big uh, tournaments live, and I'm almost uh, only playing live nowadays. Um, yeah, I got bored of the online grind. I did that too much, too many ends. I did also probably around 20,000 MTTs uh, between 2010 and 2014. Then I was playing only Sundays the rest of the years. 
but um but yeah i think i got both i think i'm 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 older now i want more travel uh living life uh meeting nice people like very interesting people like businessmen that i play with or professional poker players that i play with are very very interesting they are very smart uh they are good investors in different areas that i like i like crypto um i uh, i i sold most of my crypto that also helped me to to be uh more wealthy and play bigger uh that was a big jump for my bankroll um because i started investing in 2017 early uh like early half of the year mid of the year so it's one of the reason i when 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 crypto peak in uh like w w one year ago and stuff like it, it, it and, I, and I sold there that was that make me uh, made a really 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 good profit so yeah super interesting yeah so hearing you speak there it was almost like your your whole career you've been treating it like one big game almost like a game of chess and you've navigated your like you said the macro strategies very well so for you that's choosing the formats you play in game selection bankroll management and always having these kind of higher level concepts and where you're navigating your career which i think most players don't do this very well most players get locked into one format whether it's online or live and they're not thinking of the bigger game of like what what opportunities are out there it sounds like you were very very good at that and then we've got these kind of micro strategies that you were talking about where you might be very spontaneous you might be very uh, rash throw some chips around but you know that's just like a small part of the big picture the big picture is getting the right games manage my bankroll so it's almost like you're uh yeah almost like a chess player playing this this whole game of life and, ch and poker together and navigating that that space would that be a somewhat accurate representation yeah i think you have good reads on people <laughs> you have very accurate uh, reads cool all right so one thing i want to dive into which came up in the questionnaire which i thought was an interesting answer we asked if uh, your family was supportive for you. And you said your family weren't supportive of you at first playing poker. So first question with this one is, what were your parents wanting you to do at that age? Because I know for you, obviously, you what playing chess with your grandparents and your parents, there's probably some sort of academic or at least some projection that they, they've got for you. So when you started playing poker, what would they rather you were doing at that time? So, um, yeah, they wanted, uh, I mean, I was a radio DJ. I was already uh, um, I was already telling them since many years that I was I was about to do my career. Uh, I was doing my career. I would do my career in uh, in uh, media. So in uh, being a, a presentator, uh, animator, uh, anima doing animation of, of of talk show. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I was doing. But uh, when I realized that I was not making money because this is like paying really poorly um and it's really long because uh, uh, most of the people who get paid are way older than uh, than 20 years old they are like on their 40s they have 20 years career before getting like it's almost it takes like 10 years plus to get paid decently in those uh but I, it, it took me uh, two years to figure it out i thought uh, i could like just keep the steps so basically i was convincing my I was not convincing. I was like ending myself from from uh, from uh, from the moment where I decided to play poker because at the, when I knew uh, if I was failing, I could always go back to the house of my parent. I would say, like many young people nowadays can do that when they have parents that have a house, they would always accept them at age twenty, twenty two. So I was I, I I knew I was not going to the street. But they were uh, wanting me just to succeed in what I wanted, so which was radio. Um, but then when I decided to play poker, of course, they see that as uh, gambling and they see that as, uh, as not a career, uh, uh, as, uh, as not a possible career. So they, they would discourage me to do so. And uh, they would say me, if you do that, then you will lose a lot of uh, your... Um, your effort that you did to 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 become more famous in radio and stuff, and you will lose um, the um, you will lose the the attraction of the owners of those radio that that would not be um, 
uh, choosing you anymore and stuff because you would you would not be present anymore and stuff. So they would discourage me in that way when I would have them on the phone, um, which I guess was for my not not a bad thing because like if you if you are from the generation of my parents, then you are not um, familiar with uh, esport high level esport people or high level poker players because. There was no competition in poker before our times. So we basically are early birds for poker, like Doy Bronson and stuff were making money in cash games, in live cash games during many years. But there was no classification, tournaments, hand and mob, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, during all those years. So we basically are the generation, me, you, Rene, uh, that discover that are living the competition of poker like the yeah poker as a sport so our parents don't know about it um so yeah they, they have no bad intention and i guess all people of our generation have the same issue with their parents with poker uh so i didn't i was not angry about that and later on my father became my biggest supporter so like he's since many years my biggest supporter he's like watching all the, the coverages you know on poker news and stuff he's reading everything he's reading the the, the flips you know he's reading <laughs> the handy stories he's uh, watching the streams he's watching my stream he's watching my youtube videos he's watching reading my book on uh, amazon he's uh, he, he's like just doing a- everything he knows He's even like playing a bit of poker, like he just likes the game now, you know. And uh, so it's very nice that to see the transition between like uh, being being my parents fearing about it uh, and not and now completely opposite. My my mother knows now, like because she see a lot of interview of me, magazines, uh, cover of magazines. Uh, I was in TV in France for uh, poker. Like I was a coach in uh, La Maison du Bluff. It's, it's a TV show in France. That was uh, I was the coach the last two seasons of of that TV show. It's like Big Brother, but people play poker all day um, and get eliminated in poker. Then they get a hundred k contract if they win the hundred k live uh, tournaments contract. Um, so yeah, um, this is uh, by by those just like when your parents see you succeeding by numbers, by uh, also by uh, fame in the game, then you don't, they don't have the same opinion anymore. And, and this is also uh, one of the reasons I was so much into hustle. It's like I wanted to prove to my friends, my parents, because friends had almost same opinion as parents, like friends outside of poker, they would think you are making a mistake or something. Mm-hmm. So when you can prove them um, by your results, that you, you you made the right choice, then it's a really good feeling, you know. And this is a way that you say, okay, I end up, I finish the game in a certain way. For for many people, it's enough. They will say, okay, I finish the game, I make a living about with poker. Everybody knows that I'm making a really a really good living compared to most of the people. I'm actually making a really good living. For some people, it's completely happiness and 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 done. For me, it's not enough, as we said. Of course, I'm, I will always reach, try to reach the next uh, step. But it was really a good milestone uh, at that time. Yeah, that was a really inspiring story because I think a lot of players are in that situation where they're not getting supported by their parents. Like you said, like your parents are from a generation that don't understand poker. They have a lot of fears, a lot of worry. They think you're throwing your life away. You're going to end up in loads of debt. It's not going to work out. And you've got to prove them wrong through your longevity of making money and creating a good life circumstance through a, a very unconventional path. And I think a lot of players try to uh, get approval too early. They get to try to get support from friends and family just because they're taking that path. When in reality, success and long-term results and sustainability is where you're going to get that uh, kind of validation long-term. And sometimes it doesn't come. So for you, your dad being your biggest fan, I love that story, like watching your stuff, watching your streams, reading your books. I think like a lot of players would love that. Maybe their biggest dream would be to uh, get their dad's approval in that kind of way. So that's like the ultimate kind of version. You may not get to that level with kind of validation from your peer groups, but over time, people do start to uh, show respect and like, okay, he knows what he's doing. He's got this covered. I don't need to worry about him. Yeah, obviously you've had a lot of success publicly. So your friends and parents can just see, all right, 
even though I don't understand it that well. Now your dad does, but your mum might not. He's doing really well and we can we can stop worrying. He's got a cupboard. He's a smart guy and he's doing well for himself. So yeah, I think it's a, a really good story. I'm sure many players will be aspiring to to get the point you're at right now. So yeah, mm-hmm. final question on this one. Well, well different, different segue here. We talked about basically you losing your 3K role and then you read Elkie's book and you went back in there to uh, kind of build your role back up. You got that back and you got a point where I think you said you got to about 10K with your role. And you said, I think you said like you, you weren't you have to, you're going to continue to that strategy of like, and it's grinding in the casino there. So what was your next move when you got your role to about 10K, a bit of stability, you've overcome your initial kind of uh, uh, busting episodes. What was your next step after you, after you got to that point? So I arrived, as I said, in Cagliari, I played, you know, all those sit and goes, live sit and goes from 20 euro to 100 euro. I was grinding them, grinding the 25, 50 cents, uh, cash game, 51. So all the basic live, uh, um, offer that they had, I was grinding and I was making approximately two care months in profit. So playing every day though. So like it was really low hourly. I was not counting my hourly at that time, but if you play every day, 12 hours, seven days a week, uh, probably maybe 84. So 170, 340 hours a month uh, and making two K, uh, you're making uh, what, 10 euro an hour? Uh, 10, 10 euro an hour, I'm not even. You're making like five euro an hour or something. Uh, so yeah, it was really low hourly. Um, and uh, so I was at that time um, uh, playing for that because I loved the game also. It was all my life. I was thinking just about poker every day. I was not even having, I remember the first year, I, was, I didn't have any relation with any girl. Like, it means, like, zero. Like, not even a kiss, you know? <laughs> Nothing. Like, the first year in Cagliari, I was just with a beard, you know? Like, big beard. Like, not even taking care of myself. You know? Just, like, going to grind. And it's not me. I was, like, social as fuck before that, going out. And uh, I always been, like, uh, like very social, very, uh, very party guy. A uh, lot of success also uh, with women in general. Like... Uh, uh, just I was becoming a nerd like a nerd you know like uh, very uh, nerdy um, and um, so then I, I, I figure out that uh, this is not the way I want to live long run so I just uh, discover online poker um, I, 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 sc- I scaled with online poker because of uh, online entities so I was grinding a uh, Average buying 40 euro, I would say, on .fr and .italy. Um, I made approximately 200K profit in uh, those two years. So this was really uh, more interesting in terms of um, freedom that I, uh, that I got by having a bankroll um, standing around like 40k, 30k, 40k, because like when you make 200k profit in two and a half years, you don't have 200k bankroll, of course, but uh, because you spend because you have like fees and everything, but whatever, you just like I had like around 40, sometimes 50k bankroll, and I could uh, travel, um, which was a mistake probably because it was too early in terms of uh, bankroll management, but it was, I was not doing crazy thing. You know, I was doing uh, 400, 500 euro buying on a four days event, you know, like very deep, low variance stuff, uh, still full variance because of live MTT, but really less variance that uh, online player used to think. Uh, I was playing those, but I was playing on the side cash game. That was, the smart move. I was playing those two, four, five, five in casinos, where I was making uh, really decent money, probably some hourly around eighty euro, hundred euro. Um, then uh, after that, uh, what was the big scale? The big scale came when I start discovering online cash games in two thousand thirteen. Uh, Everybody of my entourage was poker pros, uh, fr- French or Italians, and they were all MTT players. So they were, they were all for them, like the poker is only MTT. It's only about one day make the big score in some live tournament or some big scoop on .com or whatever. Um, that was the goal of every of my poker pros friend who had like 
same bankroll as me or a little lower, a little higher, blah, blah, blah. And so with that entourage, with that kind of, um, because we are the sum of the five person we frequent the most. This is uh, really true in life and in poker also. So I could only be like them, you know. Then one day, and thanks to those regs that were invited by the room uh, because of regback, those online cash game regs that arrive in some spots uh, on the live circuit in Vegas, because they got qualified by the reg back that they make, they had to use the package. So if not, it's lost. So basically I met new French people that I never met before. So I asked, because I'm very social, I asked, guys, what is your nickname? So the nickname, I didn't know. So I was like, how you are here? So we ask a question and they are very, in the like you said before, Rene said like, Cash game players, especially at that time, were very uh, aware that there was a lot of money in cash game. And they were very aware of people not knowing there is a lot of money in, in online cash game. Or people thinking it's too hard or, or it's, yeah, it's not beatable because of the wreck or blah, blah. So they were not speaking and publicizing uh, online cash game. And at that time in France, there was no uh, coaching sites that were. Uh, explaining about it so they were only like uh, before that time but it was speaking about dot com never about dot fr or dot italy so we were not relating with that we were thinking oh God, those guys are too good they are playing on dot com that's why they make money whatever. so no one knew so I, I basically by speaking with them and one night one of them was drunk and connect on his uh, account uh, on this French uh, website and at 100k bankroll, I see 100k, which I never see before, like, or maybe once, someone who won MTT, <laughs> but like, uh, I see six figures and I was like, how, well, how did you make that? He said, I told you in cash game. And it doesn't make sense, you know, and I repeat, like, what did you win? <laughs> like, for me, it was like, he won the jackpot something, you know. But, bro, I'm, I told you I played only cash games, so I didn't win any MTT, any, uh, anything, you know. Okay, so why it's on the bankroll and why it's not used or in bank account, you know. I had, and I realized I had so many um, limits in beliefs, beliefs limit, because I couldn't process that, that number in an online bankroll. After two years being a pro, like uh, or two and a half years, so it was uh, very interesting to me. So I start playing cash game, and uh, actually I realized that there was uh, like the hourly was insane compared to playing uh, entities. This is um, probably four times more. This was for I was playing heads up. There was still heads up on most of the sites, so I was sitting in heads up everywhere uh, in hundred and uh, two hundred. Um, I was sitting in uh, six max everywhere, playing heads up and six max at the same time. The good thing is I had already good skills about multi tabling because I was playing twelve uh, to uh, sixteen tournaments at the same time during many years uh, that period um, profitably. So I could directly play uh, like eight uh, six max in cash game and uh, two heads up at the same time. You know, so I was playing. Uh, in heads up, it was bumming basically. It was sitting on 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 heads up table, like every reg was sitting. You could see like a list of 20, 30 regs seated, and uh, one out of two, one out of two, one out of two. Then someone come, he shoots you, then he play against you. So that was how how it was for heads up. But for six max, I was playing every table, but table was running only if there was a uh, some uh, non non reg. So. I was playing that. I played 2 million hands like that, 2.5 million hands. In uh, uh, three years, I made a bit more than half a million uh, in profit uh, all combined. Uh, I used that money to, uh, because I burned out definitely, because I, I burned out not, I, don't, I didn't burn my money, but I burned out mentally where I was, my routines were like 12 hours grind a night. I was playing from midnight to 12, midnight to 12 every day. On twelve, uh, on twelve or thirteen uh, rooms, uh, at the same time, and I was like uh, equivalent of supernova in four of them. So I had like thirty percent back on four of them, which is doesn't probably exist nowadays. Oh yeah, some some somewhere it can exist, but and 
I was also making good money with uh, with rake bag, but it was small compared to what I was making on the tables. Uh, my, if you see, like it's so funny. I still, I'm, I might have a graph still on on my website uh, where maybe I have 1.5 million ends on the, on the graph and maybe 250k profit. Like this is without uh, rake bag and stuff, but and I have like a red line that is horrible. You know, like losing as fuck, and it's all about blue line, especially at the time. It's all about showdown winnings. Like you, you just make make money at showdown. You just make money at showdown. That's that's how my style was, and most of the regs were having the same kind of line. Um, so yeah, I was making uh, with that money. I, I burn out because I was playing too much, too many hours, too many hours, uh, and 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 not having a real life. So I wanted again to travel again. So I made again travel. And when I was traveling, I was enjoying the life cash games. I was enjoying playing bigger now with no fear because um, now I can play anything, you know? Like the, the games were not big big enough. I was asking for straddle. I was like, what the fuck, you know? Like, guys, you are playing. How come you are playing that small? Like, uh, you know, I was, it's one table, you know, we need to play big. So, yeah, I I, I, I start loving cash game, life cash game again so much. And I played uh, big 2550 and higher during many years. Uh, I met Rene, I think, at uh, at some uh, cash game table uh, in EPT, but I'm not sure if it was the case or not. And oh, was it uh, Rene, Malta? it was in Malta. It was in EPT, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I said it in the introduction, man. You tried to hit on my wife in a jacuzzi in the Marriott. So it was not in the table, poker table. No, no, no. And then you invite us over. We were living, I was living in Belmonte. You know, next yeah, to your I start speaking with your wife. Yeah, you, you, you try to hit not, my wife not, in a jacuzzi. You were yeah. not next to her. You were not. No, I no, know. I wasn't there. That, 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 that's why. That's you why I chance, didn't know. You know? I, I, yeah, of course, when I, <laughs> I don't do that when I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no and, and, well, and, 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 then, and then we got started. You invited us over to your place. Of course. Uh, yeah, with yeah, your yeah, set up yeah, with 10 screens. I don't know how many screens you had. Yeah, yeah, six screens at the time. Uh, yeah, because of the multi-rooming, so I had I had no sitting script. Like many regs use sitting script, which mm -hmm. was illegal. And I I didn't want to do anything in my career. I didn't want to do anything illegal at no point. So I decided to find always macro way to uh, to have the same result or almost the same, you know, as the people mm -hmm. who use sitting script. So when I was seeing all the lobby, I could sit very quick uh, because I had my eyes on on the lobbies on other screens, and my tables were on my uh, main screen in the middle and all of those screens were like lobby but fully um, shown in 510 uh, 36 uh, and 1020 so yeah because yeah i didn't speak but then then of course from nl 100 and 200 after a few months i was already uh, playing nl 1k so very quick i was making average 25 25k a month uh, so when i was playing my 70k ends uh, in the month so i was grinding the highest text of, of dot fr and dot italy of every room during uh, all those years and i have used all those screens just to, to be able to sit very quick before the table get full when when someone come table gets fulfilled in in very very few moments but uh, yeah because it was the night not too crowded the the websites because i had a lot of websites because i had a lot of vision about what is going on on the lobbies i could be very quick so that was my way to to make money and then after that as i said the, the live cash games during all those years and then i switched to to play more tournaments because i want more adrenaline it's like the grind in live cash games even if you make like 400 500 hourly uh you you get bored at some point because because you're still making like you're still playing for for, make, for making one buy in during the day and you have still a bank, you have a bank loan of a few millions you don't want to just play for making one buy-in. So it's like, it's a bit like, uh, for, for someone like me that likes challenge, it was a bit boring. So I, I started playing high rollers and, and, and big tournaments and I enjoyed and I had a really successful year last year, uh, which was my first year playing uh, full-time uh, live tournaments. So I hope I will have the same uh, this year. For now, I'm, I'm losing this year, uh, but it's the beginning of the year. So we will see. Yeah, what a ride. And yeah, it sounds like you're somebody who enjoys like taking on new challenges, taking on new formats, taking on yeah, new things to do. 
it sounds like that early part of your career, you got quite lucky because you went like a, a box of players who were all playing MTTs. Your kind of worldview was quite narrow at that time. And then just by a chance going to the casino because of that uh, kind of uh, coupon or buy-in that you won. And then introducing yourself to cash game players. You're like, wait a second, you guys are making a lot of money playing cash games. And obviously in that moment, your curiosity and your charismatic personality of meeting people must have been a good skill set in that scenario. And yeah, it sounds like once your eyes were open, you're like, wait a second. There's other games going on. I, I'm, 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 I'm going for the the real money. So yeah, really, really interesting. I, I like how you uh, pieced that all together. I was listening along and as a, a fan of your story, that was really, really interesting. So great stuff. So Renny, would you like to pick it up from the the hot tub, or you want to pick it from a different point of the the story? The hot tub, from the hot tub. Yeah, we we could pick it up hot from the tub. hot tub. Yo, yo, I'm still uh, playing uh, grinding online cash because then you mentioned you switched to live, and I was curious, like. When you then switch back to live, what was you mentioned? The games were very good, but I'm sure there were certain adjustments that you had to make in your game going from online yeah. to live. Yeah. Uh, what What were some of the adjustments that you had to make, and what are some things you think online players that come to play live uh, often do wrong? For example, I I played live with you. What do I do wrong? Tell me. Tell me. All. No, but you are you are very good uh, in live also. So you you don't do. <laughs> wrong Stupid uh, stuff. Okay. Wrong thing. No, no, no. No. Uh, I would say that most of the online player, what they do wrong uh, when they go to live, and what I was probably doing wrong, uh, is the fact that you are not aware of what you give away uh, physically. So you are like more in front of your computer with your emotions, like doing the hands and stuff. And actually for people who are used to live, it could be readable. Um, so you need to be more like, um, kind of not moving too much, you know, like I would say, like not yeah, too systematic, much. systematic, uh, right? In your behavior. Yeah, more like... systematic. Yeah, yeah. That's that's one one thing for, for online players. But then what they tend to do wrong, and that's really bad for the game, uh, is they tend to, not um, create a fun atmosphere at the table, which is the whole purpose of why people who are not professional poker players play the game in casino. They play for one reason, who is the main reason, it's to have fun. They don't play for making money. They are, especially the I speak, about let's speak about what I play. So what you play also already. Let's speak about high stakes. Let's speak about decent stakes, like where people play few thousands of euro in front of them. Let's don't speak about the blinds because sometimes you can play a 510, but the 510 people will all have 5k in front of them. So we we're gonna consider that as high stakes for life. Let's speak about all the games where people play few thousands in front of them and are not professional poker play why they play they play because they want to have a fun night a fun day this is simple this doesn't make sense for many poker players especially online players because they play for making money for making out so they think unconsciously that everybody do the same so it's normal to be uh, silent it's normal to be uh, just uh, money oriented to make tilt other people uh, to just try to have all the edges to make the maximum money. No, this is normal for you, reality, but your reality is not the reality of the people who are not playing poker for a living. So you need, if you want, that those games exist always and those games last long because you want also your hourly tool. To be, uh, to be, you want to be able. The, the most problematic in poker is like the, the fact that we cannot in high stakes live cash game we cannot have games running every time because games die. Games die when, for example, there is no um, fun anymore. So when there is no fun anymore, like people stop playing and the game break. Okay, so when the game break, then you cannot work anymore as a professional poker player, which is sad. So we are all responsible of the game breaking. So if we want that this um, um, continue, uh, the game last longer, the fun is uh, very important. So we need to provide fun. We need to provide 
challenge, fun, um, interesting moments, nice uh, conversation, and not stuff by being nice for being nice, you know? I was speaking about like a game where we don't know the people or we know them sometimes, but we need to make uh, something like very friendly, very funny, very uh, nice to be in. And this is not intuitive for most of the players. This is macro part. So the yeah, macro- I was gonna, I was gonna say it. It really relates to your macro micro story. A player goes in and focuses on the micro, whereas you're focusing the macro, right? Yeah, when you focus on the micro, you're gonna increase your win rate on the short run, but you're gonna lose a lot on the long run. And that's yeah, you 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 basically gain hourly, but you cannot realize that hourly because there's no gain. Exactly. But you you all you you can also think all your life as a poker pro, then that it's not your fault. That is the casino fault. That is the yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah. the poker is dying, that blah 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 blah. But or you can be part of it and be like. I can make the changement. We are speaking about few tables in the world that are playing more than 10, 20. We are playing, mm-hmm. we are speaking about probably less than 50 tables at the same time that are running in 10, 20. I, I think it's even less mm-hmm. uh, a public table. You will be very surprised. Many people will be very surprised that in Las Vegas, the capital of gambling, there is no more than publicly a 2040 running every day. $20, $40 big blind. This is high stakes. Yeah, it's a high stakes, but because people play 5K, 10K in front of them. But it's not the high stakes that you imagine there is. And many people are like, what? There is only 2040? What about the 501K? Doesn't exist, bro. What about the 100, 200? Exist, but it's private. So you cannot get. Only if you focused on the macro and if you're fun to play with, right? Yeah. You can maybe access that if you if you are like that. But also, it's your goal to make the public game uh, more fun, become than the bigger, game. longer, and have more public games. So it's your it's your your goal to be always whatever game you play, private or public. You need to provide fun, and provide fun. It's also part of the job of professional poker player yeah That's so basically we are we are entertainers yeah. people want to have a good time they come to the poker table we are entertainers so they they sort of pay us to entertain them yeah okay yeah. this is yeah, and, and people yeah. walk out of a shitty movie uh, so if you go to a shitty movie you go out yeah exactly you can imagine what you can do like when you want to do something you are you are you have money you want to do something exciting tonight you can go in the club but it's always the same thing you go in a club, you take a table, you're gonna spend a few thousand euro to, to buy, or maybe 1,000 euro or 500 euro to buy bottles. You're gonna get drunk. Music is, is whatever, but like you can do that. Uh, you can go to cinema, to the movies, but yeah, again, if there are any, any good movies, you can go to play poker. And poker is probably the most interesting thing that there is uh, for for people who wants to enjoy their night and stuff. It's one of the most entertaining things, but it can be very boring, very terrible experience. Um, and you don't want to play that much or that many hours just because the table is silent as fuck, uh, boring as fuck. People don't play small games, mini games like Seven Deuce um, or uh, maybe a stand-up game, you know, those are the games that, uh, that we play in my game in Malta. Uh, those are the games we play at Bellagio. Um, they should just make those games mandatory in every live game, in my opinion. That would be so awesome. <laughs> seven deuce, at least, yeah. The seven deuce should be mandatory in every... Like, if you start adding mine. all the combos, you don't need to add all the eight, three, nine, nine, four, because it can become a bit uh, changing too much the game. But let's say seven deuce should be mandatory. Why playing a cash game without the seven deuce when it's the worst end in poker? No one played it. And we can make it uh, it's fun to play with it, you know? Oh, and yeah, like yeah, when yeah, you yeah. see Super Pro saying no to seven juice, like it's weird. requested by a recreational player or even not requested by a recreational player, it's it's wrong. It's just wrong. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's funny. I, I'm actually starting to feel like the fish because when I play live, I also play for usually for entertainment. I like it. So then when I go to a table and it's all quiet, headphones, and also I'm like, okay, yeah, this is no fun. So I, yeah. I feel a little bit like the recreation in this case. Yeah, this is exactly how I feel also for, for myself. Um, bringing nice atmosphere, it's, uh, 
it's 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 key. So the, the macro is key for online player. You need to understand that you come from online. One day you're gonna play live because you will want playing. You will want you 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 will want to play bigger or softer field. So you will want to play live. Also you will travel for whatever, and you will have no computer with you or blah blah blah. You will play live at some point. So just remember those things. Do it. It will be better for all the pokers in the next 50 years because just live poker will not die. Online poker, we are not sure. So yeah, yeah, online yeah. poker, we are really not sure. Uh, they, they should try to make the online games fun as well, right? For example, ACR has bump pots. It's great. Yeah, I think it's great. We have bump pots in Bellagio's. We do yeah. bump pots also in my games sometimes. Bump pots, stand-up mm -hmm. games, seven deuce game. Hey, I'm, I'm in for all the games. Uh, when you, you also play high rollers, right? Do you see yeah. similar patterns in the live high roller scene? Or is it yeah. a bit more serious? No, no, no. They are in, and I wanted to to give a big shout out to them, to the online, to the live rights that play those high rollers. They are really, really, most of them, they are really, really professional. Uh, and they provide a lot of fun. They provide a lot of good time. Um uh, even losing uh during uh, one month in Poker Go Studio in a row, I can be down like 300 k Uh I will have a very good uh, Many times I will have very good uh, a, a very good day at the studio, even busting nine for like four paid or something, uh, or no, sorry, if, if, uh, bubble like or something, uh, nine for eight paid. Um, I will just have a nice uh, experience many times, uh, even as a pro. And uh, I think for the VIP, they they have a nice experience also because like the the regs are very, very accomplished in poker and they're very accomplished in macro also. So they have a very good macro uh, on those things. They provide a lot of fun. They provide a lot of good uh, conversation. This is, yeah, this is the, the way I want to play poker all my life. I want to play poker with people that are smart, that are providing value at the table. It's like a dinner, you know? A poker table is like having a dinner. And in those I rollers, it's the case. Maybe the only moment where it's not the case is when they play really big, when they play like 250K, uh, but up 200k, honestly, up 200k, I don't see uh, almost any difference. Like the 10k is like they they are like everybody is laughing. Like it's it's really chill, you know. The 10k is like so, so so the 10k are like your local 10 dollar sitting goes. Definitely, <laughs> no, definitely, it's it's not different than the even the 20 euro sit and go that I was doing in Cagliari was some sometimes more tense than the 10k that I'm playing in uh, in Vegas in Poker Go Studio. Um, yeah, bravo, shout out to Kerry Katz to have created uh, Poker Go Studio. It's a studio de uh, only for high rollers, only for uh, hanging out, playing uh, big money in poker, but also um, having this exclusive place with no noise, no slot machine next to you, uh, not uh, random people that make a lot of noise or make problem at the table, uh, just people who are... Um, uh, playing for fun, but for big money, but still for fun, provide a lot of fun, even the pros. So shoot out for that. We have good service, good drinks, uh, good food coming from the different restaurants of Aria. So I really, I really I like what they, they build with Poker Go Studio, what Kerry Katz built with uh, this Poker Go Tour, which are all the high rollers, basically. Um, almost all the high rollers in the world are under Poker Go Tour uh, nowadays. So 10K plus, it's a Poker Go Tour except maybe for the EPTs, except that every every other uh, poker go. So reflecting on, uh, let's do some reflecting on your, I think it was 13 year long career. What do you think yeah. is uh, some of the most, what are some of the most important lessons that poker has taught you? Mm. Poker has taught me, yeah, the most, wait, I'm gonna, <laughs> Yeah, no, this is a big question. Take a zip of water, prepare. <laughs> no, because I speak a lot. Um, so, poker made me read people in life. The intention of the people way more clearly. So, thanks to poker, I can read what is the intention of the people in normal life of like a friend, a family person, uh, a girl, um, whatever person that enter my life, I can, I can read most of the time 
very accurate the, in an accurate mode what she he wants from me because of poker because we we are trained as poker player as professional poker player to always ask ourselves what he wants me to do in that spot what is representing here what is my range here what he thinks i have here so we are always training 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 millions of time to ask ourselves those right questions that make us do a logic move to answer those right questions so same for taking decision in life with the people i take way better decisions because of poker in my personal life in my uh, business life or other than poker so i have uh, the as you know the first coaching website in french so we are not uh, even concurrent uh, that's a good thing <laughs> because i'm doing all my content in french uh, so pokerpro.fr uh, this is a, a business that i i built in 2016 um, because i had a lot of demand from people following me on twitch uh, and actually i did twitch because i was a radio dj not because i, I start to plan a, a business i had no plan i was just enjoying the uh, enjoying the twitch grind on the sundays because all the week i was grinding an uh, online cash game so i was uh, i started twitch in 2015 i was grinding online cash game every day and i wanted to, to communicate with people i was so sad i was so so i was making money but i was so bored pissed uh, burned out by by playing 12 hour a day parenting but also playing like all those six max tables blah 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 that I, one day I decide, okay, the Sunday it's gonna be my Twitch day. I will stream now what I do, just uh, what I do in tournament because um, I didn't want <laughs> at the time I didn't want to, to publicize uh, the um, the cash game streets. You know, I didn't want to to show um, that it was really really profitable. To be honest, so that was a bit egoist. But I didn't want. I was a bit like those cash game player to keep it for myself. And I was playing the tournaments on Sunday on Twitch. And I was having fun speaking with the chat and everything, growing my audience. Um, so yeah, I built the Poker Pro after one year of Twitch because they were asking me to give them tips about everything. There I was showing how I played, how I grind the cash game. There I was showing everything about the strategies and stuff. So um, my business relation with the people I, that, that helped me in the business, um, I, I could clearly see that I had like good... Uh, good understanding of, of what people wanted, what people are planning their next move and, and stuff like that. You know, I was definitely aware of many things that I would have never been aware of before my poker career. So I, I guess poker helped you to read people so good um, that it's like the best skill, uh, one of the best skills you can have in life. Oh, that's, that's, that, that's very interesting. Uh... I can't say I learned the same. I would say, uh, I would say that those are definitely skills that I could still uh, further develop. I can, uh, and especially uh, a person in your position, you are, I think, a very um, how do you say that? You are a very, a very friendly guy. You give easily. You are a wealthy guy. So I think also to protect yourself against maybe your because of your own character, these skills are very, very useful. Because I can imagine that, especially along. The ways when you travel, you meet a lot of people who have ill intentions, right? When they yeah. when they might see you, like, oh, I can take advantage of this guy. Oh, this guy is uh, quite easily given. Oh, he's wealthy. Oh, I can probably uh, lift along on his success. You know, you are, you are very popular as well on Instagram, YouTube, etc. Actually, when you speak with people, bro, um, that are like uh, even wealthy and stuff, but are not poker player, many mm -hmm. people comes up with uh, scam stories where they get scammed by by their wife, by their uh, uh, a, a divorce, uh, or by uh, their uh, partner, or by their, um, they got separated with uh, this person, uh, this friendship ends, and it was a mess because blah, blah. And so many people that are actually smart, you find them smart, you know them, they, but they were not a poker player in life. You know, They were never a professional poker player. And I think I avoid a lot of, like I'm avoiding, I, I don't think I'm getting ever, almost ever scammed, you know? It's, it's more and more difficult to scam me 
um i say that and one day i will get scammed big you know but big <laughs> uh, whatever but like i mean it's really more difficult than ever to scam me and uh, it should be easier in theory but uh, because i can i can feel when it's uh, i can feel the people i can feel the person i can know what is what his intentions i can even when it's not obvious and it's nicely done i can spot some stuff you know i can spot even i I like to spot that, you know, I like, because I travel a lot in luxury uh, hotels and stuff. Um, oh, I, I like to spot the strategy, the marketing strategy they have, you know, like how they get teached in the, in the hotel, uh, hotel school they had before, um, what they are doing, what does that mean, what they expect, when they expect the tip or whatever, like when they try to induce you for a tip, um, when they they do that uh, for a certain reason why they do that is it like pure uh, uh sympathy now or is it because uh, they they wait for something precise at that point i like to analyze those things you know it's uh, it's very interesting i ask myself question why this person did that why did person what that person say that you know those questions you don't ask yourself in life when you are not a poker player most of the time those are not the question you ask yourself but as a poker player um, you ask yourself those questions way more than other people and you can answer them really quick in different kind of situation with a variety of, uh, of answer that you can give or action that you can do that will induce another thing from the person and, uh, and yeah. That's very, very interesting. And given, given all your experience and you know, your, your rise to the top, what would be a tip that you could give some of our listeners who are maybe aspiring pros or are already pros, what would, what would be a tip you would give them? Maybe one on the macro level and one on the micro level, or is macro micro thinking actually the tip for me? Actually, that's a very big takeaway for the, from, from this podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, the macro. So I would say the, 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 the biggest macro tip will be the, to always count uh, their funds, to always count their bankroll, to always count where is the money that they have, to split it in the most possible places, um, and to always know uh, how much they have and how much they can afford to invest in different kind of uh, games but also in different kind of uh, business areas or investment stuff. Uh, basically, it's a, I would say it's, it's a success tip in general. It's like always know how much you have, where is the money, make uh, counts of the different um, um, stuff. Like accounting. It's very important to account for, even if something we don't like as, uh, as human in general, I think we don't like, we like to, to close our eyes, you know, about certain things, especially our finances. Uh, I, I truly, yeah, I truly think it's one of the best way to, 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 to manage uh, your career and your, uh, your wealth over the years. Uh, this, this is a macro tip, I would say, for the micro part. Uh, for the macro part also, we can add the coaching because getting coached by people of every area that you want to improve on. Now I'm, I'm learning Russian, for example. I want to learn to speak Russian. I speak Italian, English, French. Uh, I speak a bit of German. Uh, I want to speak Russian because I like the language. I, I listen to Russian rap since so many years now. I have many Russian or, or Ukrainian friends. Um, I definitely want to speak uh, the language. So I'm learning. I'm taking a, a teacher on Zoom calls, OK? Uh, this seem logic but like many times i was saying myself i want to learn something but you don't take action on that you will nothing will happen and the best way to take action actually for the lazy people like me and many people are lazy is to take someone that you pay for forcing you to learn so she forced me to learn at least two hours a week so i i, I don't do any homework she give me <laughs> but I, during those two hours, I'm actually learning something. I have no choice because I have to be present. So you pay for accounting. Again, it's like a sport coach. When you pay a sport coach, it's not because he will teach you the exercises. Like everybody knows you can watch a YouTube video. Like it's not complicated. Like it's not like poker. <laughs> like 
we are not speaking about becoming a bodybuilder, but if you just want to be in shape and everything, to be honest, with just YouTube, we can be in shape, okay? Um, and do the exercise properly. But the most difficult part is to go to the gym and to go almost every day. This is the most difficult, but how you go every day? But you go only if someone waits for you there. You cannot disappoint this person. You pay this person for being there. So you pay for accounting. So this is a tip, is paying people to account for you. So paying for accounting and accounting yourself on your own finances, you can actually maybe pay someone to account on your own finances, but this is not what I suggest because most of the people you can pay for accounting for your finances are bad accounting themselves on their finances because people who are really wealthy, they will never uh, sell their services to count for you. So basically paying for someone that will account for you, it's almost not possible. So you will need to, to do it yourself, except if it's like pure uh, accounting where someone can, can go, uh, someone that you trust can go in, uh, in all your, your different funds and, and just like making a resume Excel sheets about it. Why not? But what I, in theory, you will have to do uh, yourself, uh, most of the things on finance. Then for micro, for micro, I would always suggest to, to reanalyze uh, every uh, hand uh, that you played that are a decent size pot um, to re um, speak with your, with one of your coach about those and send message, write them on the, on the phone directly after having playing them. Uh, if you play online, just like keep track on, on, on big pots on, on tracker, just like note your hands, uh, put them in special group, uh, solve them um, just to see what was the different sizing that you could have. Uh, just um, do those, um, do this kind of work on, on, on precise ends that are uh, important and uh, in, in your games. Like if it's, um, if it's a big pot not, uh, in cash game, but if it's a, a late game end that costs a lot of money in terms of uh, um, in, in, in tournament, uh, we review it like for, for people who play tournaments uh, with the Hold'em resources for uh, ICM uh, uh, to, to include the price pool and everything. Um, just like get the shit done when you don't want to do it because you had pain by losing that pot or by losing that hand. You don't want to think about that hand anymore. It's a bit like the finance. You, you want to close your eyes and go like, I will play another tournament. I will play another a 10 hour session instead of that just do the the hand by hand review um yeah yeah so basically do the stuff that you don't want to do right don't stick your head in the sand don't try to ignore it you're basically getting you 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 got quite good maybe in confronting the uncomfortable you feel uncomfortable doing it but hey it's something that you got to get done yeah any uh, any any tips that you are writing down for yourself here adam I'm writing down loads of tips. I've got probably two pages worth. So <laughs> I'll, I'll steer the conversation in a, in a weird direction if I start rereading all my notes. Uh, but yeah, one thing that I really want to touch on, which came up early in the conversation, was when you compared relationships to being an asset. You said putting time into your relationships is like an investment. And often yeah. that comes out of your short-term playing time, but the long-term is a huge like win. And I think this is a really interesting mindset to have because... I think most poker players struggle with this dynamic in all honesty, mm -hmm. their relationships, they don't invest time into them because they think yeah. I'll have success in poker first. And then I'll build these relationships after when I've got all my money and it doesn't work that way. So uh, for you, when you started to uh, really invest in your relationships, cause I know you talked about around the 2016 time when you were streaming, you're very miserable, you're very unhappy. When did it start to click for you that wait a second, I need to start investing in my relationships. Yeah, this is really, 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 really nicely. Uh, re uh nicely said what you say now it's like exactly explain uh, you explain exactly how people uh, so many many times uh, with english i struggle to to give my my precise opinion on stuff but because you i understand way better of course than i speak uh, then I, I i want to say like you said it <laughs> and i cannot you know but uh, I uh, okay so let's 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 go from from there but there was the time and most of the people the poker players have the same problem they they just focus on making the money okay 
So, but the problem is you burn out. So you burn out for sure. And you burn out many times. So every time you burn out, you're gonna lose like, in cash game, you're gonna lose maybe 10 buying more than what you should have lost. Not, I don't speak of course in one session, I speak in, in a period, um, like 10 buy-ins of pure spew, um, like that would, could have been a void totally. Uh, I noticed also I could lose the, um, the same amounts of buy-ins in tournaments that I could avoid totally, or like a big, a big pay jump that I missed or, or stuff like that, you know, or a big spew that I did in semi-final or stuff like that. So you will end up doing those spew because you are not happy. So those spew come in poker. The translation of you not being happy will be a spew that you are never doing before, that you never done before, or you, that you do really, really rarely. And why you did that at that precise moment, it's always correlated because you were not happy in your life at that moment. And that's among the years, on certain years, I noticed that every spew that are really big spew of my career, I did at moments where I was not really happy. And of course, the opposite happens. And that's really, really, really interesting because I'm gonna win big in a cash game or win big in, in for a month or win like big in tournaments when I will be really, really happy in life. So we will, we will see, but this is maybe just the variance. You got lucky at that moment and unlucky at that moment. Yeah, there is part of it, but there is actually a lot of magic that happens when you are very happy. So <laughs> this is insane, but this is definitely the case. I'm a very rational guy, but I can tell you that the magic happens when you are very happy in life, when you are very happy with the different, uh, um, side of your life, like the relation part, the healthy uh, body, healthy mind, um, then your poker becomes really strong. Your confidence increase. It increases your the quality of your 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 A game. Your A game. Uh, you are more pl playing your A games than ever, and in it increases then your result. You can get results that you never get before. Okay, um, so actually the only way to succeed on the long run, to not spew uh, your bankroll at one point, because some people, they can go really deep in that, you know, like me, I'm gonna lose 10 by in and be mad at me, like on a period, like crazy, you know, because I will be very harsh of myself, but some people, they will lose half of their bankroll, you know, <laughs> or all their bankroll in some period because of, of the same reasons um, before making adjustments. So the only way to, you will have burnouts and you have to deal with it. You have to deal with them, but to reduce the amount of burnouts you will have and to reduce the effects, the bad effects of the burnouts and the money that you will lose in those periods, you will need to create a balance that is uh, the balance, uh, the perfect balance for you. And for diff it's different for, diff for many people, it's different, but it always includes relationship, uh, if we are men, it includes like uh, also uh, women, sex, and I guess also for a woman, it includes sex also and and uh, and relationship. But like I will speak for for men poker player because I'm a men poker player, so uh, it includes uh, friendship, uh, friendship in poker, but friendship outside of poker. It's very important. That's the most difficult to to um, to keep because uh, the people are very far from you physically, mentally and you, your road start to, we, we, we are losing um, years by years a bit more our friends outside of poker. And that's very difficult uh, to maintain. So to maintain them, you need to actually take time off and do the travel yourself because usually they work, they have, uh, they, they have obligation and you don't have that many obligation. You can just keep those tournaments. There will be scoop next year. There will be other tournaments. The fish not gonna leave. The, 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 the game will not gonna end tomorrow. So you can just keep that tournament. You can just keep that period that even two months you can take off. It's no problem. You have the finance to do it. You can spend money. It's no big deal to spend money because it's for your own happiness. You are spending for your own happiness. You are spending for yourself. You are spending for uh, your relation. So you are spending just investing basically. In it's not spending. It becomes investing in your relation. Your your basically by creating time by by forcing the time to be um, 
to be for you and your friends. Your friends are working, no problem. Gonna take, you fly there, they have weekends. You fly there on weekends and you take hotel not far from them. Uh, you don't disturb them to be in their, in their house, but you see them on the weekends and you go out with them where they go out usually. You go eat, uh, you invite them at restaurants. You have more money than them. Why, why you should not invite them at restaurants? Why you should not pay? You know, like e every girls I frequent, uh, I'm always paying uh, for a restaurant. I'm always paying. I'm, I'm never asking to divide or, or even ex-girlfriends or stuff after one year or something. You know, people start sharing or, or say like, we need to do 50-50. Uh, you have also money. But I never do that. I, I did that maybe 15 years ago, but it's been like 10 years or something. I never, I never do that. I always invite just because I think this is um, better. This is just better. This is just like, you should be generous. You, you, you earn as a poker player way more money than most of the people. Like why you should, why you should not be generous with that money. You will feel better and you will also, um, make the relation better in general because you will invest for the relation in certain way. You invest, spend more time with the, with the people that are in normal life where they need to work for, for employer. They, 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 they get paid really low in terms of hourly compared to what they should be paid because sometimes they are very smart and they, they get paid really low. So yeah, they, they, you invest in the relation, you invest in, in the time. And this is really key. If you do that and you forget about what you get teach as a child because sometimes our parents have limits in that. You know, they, they, they think uh, they would teach you that you need to keep your money, that you need to, to be like, uh, like that with the money. Money is very important, blah, blah. You know, they will teach you so many things that stay in you. If you can remove those things and, and take your own opinion about what should be your balance that makes you pleasure yourself and that allow you to play your best game then, but you will play your best game then and you will have your best results. That's how I proceed. Yeah. Wow. So, so refreshing. I really like that mentality. And I've almost never heard a poker player really go uh, that deep on why relationships are so important. And the way you broke it down was it almost fits into your micro macro kind of worldview. So the way I was like listening there, I was th thinking like your mood is your EV in the, in the moment, which is like the micro strategy. So if you're in a negative mood, you're going to lose out in the short term. Being happy, you've got a plus EV state of mind, which is going to generate more income in the short term. And then we've got the macro, which is the long-term investment in those relationships. And like you said, that's quite diverse. We've got poker friends, we've got personal relationships, we've got outside friends who are often the hardest. Right now, I'm living in Bali. I've been here for seven years and I'm exactly what you said. No, it's not drift from my uh, outside of poker friends who are just living their lives in London, Germany, or in England. And I have to make a lot more effort to see them, to speak to them because they've got stuff going on and it's on me to, to make those relationships sustainable. But I know if I do, that's the macro strategy. That's long-term happiness. That's long-term fulfilling relationships, which I live for the rest of my life. So I need to take some time out my busy schedule to uh, connect with those people, to build that macro strategy of healthy long-term relationships. So yeah, it's really, really good. I think it's, uh, it's things like, like I said, most poker players just, do the opposite. They neglect this area so much till they have so much pain in their relationships. They burn out so hard because their relationships are so in tatters. And then they go, uh, all right, well, now what do I do? And they try to fix it, fix it later. But in honesty, it's a, it's a, a long-term commitment and long-term investment in these. So yeah, I'm really glad you went so deep on that because I think a lot of players will have to reflect on this and go, uh, how am I showing up in my relationships? Because even myself, I'm thinking, how am I showing up in my relationships as a, as a byproduct of that? Because I know uh, exactly what you said is so true. Like if, if I'm having good relationships, I'm a happier version of myself. I perform better at everything I do. So why am I not taking care of that when I need to? So it's, it's something that I think a lot of players will hopefully resonate with and take some actions to, uh, to correct that. So yeah, thank you for sharing. That was it. That was really good. No problem. Better to anticipate, better to anticipate also uh, than to try to fix it when it's too late. Uh, for example, when you lose, you are like a poker player or whatever. You have a girlfriend. Uh, many poker players are like that. They have girlfriends since long, many years. Okay, the relation ends. They broke up. Then they try all uh, their energy, effort, money, blah, 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 to get back their ex. Okay, they, they try to get their ex back. Because why? Because first of all, they don't have ab abundance because they, they didn't work on themselves as a person. So they don't attract a lot of person around them, to be honest, friends, women, and everything. So when they have like that girlfriend during so many years, they, when they lose that girlfriend, then they, they think, 
but fuck, I will never have a girlfriend again, or it will take so many years again, or what they... So they, they try, and it's not for the... And the, the girl will realize it's not for the good reason that the guy coming back. He's coming back because he has no choice, like... And the girls will notice that and will never come back to him uh, because she has choice and because it's already he already screwed the relation, so it's already his fault. Uh, mm. To not have those situation, and I, I and I had those situation before, so I made those mistakes also. So, and it's been many years now that I'm not making those mistakes anymore because. I analyze what happened, why did I do wrong and everything. Like same process that I use for poker. I analyze in relation to what I did wrong and everything. So, so I, I pre-anticipate, I anticipate, I work on the relations all, not all the time, but all the free time that I allow me, I, I try to work a bit on the relation. I take time, it take time, you know, it take time, energy, effort, uh, it's like an asset, like like we said before. Uh, friendship uh, relation, it's for every type of relation. Family, same thing. Family, if you avoid your family, but you love them inside you, you want to, you know that you love them, you know that you you want to see them more, just go see them more because you will, and I, I say also that for myself, because I don't see them as often as I should. So, you should work on the, on those relations because this miss, this lack of relation, this lack of of what you want truly in your heart, will cause, in any case, big damage in your bankroll, big damage in your uh, career, uh, if you don't work on it. So yeah, amazing, amazing advice. Yeah, I'm gonna re-listen to this whole section because this 100% applies to me right now, and I think a lot of poker players will almost just being not putting enough time into their relationships. And like you said, it's way better to be preventative and to invest upfront in your relationships. You've almost got to do it that way rather than waiting for the relationships to break down and then try to repair, repair the damage. And like you said, it takes consistent effort. The way you explain it there, you talk about your relationships always being on your mind. You've got free time. You're investing time into your relationships. You're, you're taking almost like EV from your profitable days to speak with friends, to connect with people, to often fly to see people. And yeah, I think we've got to start thinking our ways, our lives in that way. So yeah, I'm definitely going to read us into this section and start to uh, apply these concepts. It also, it also apply. I, uh, it's also applied to cutting. You can cut relation. You can cut um, to create space for your uh, life and for your mindset. Toxic relation, uh, people that uh, ask you too many things, uh, people that you try to help stack, stack, whatever, uh, that consume your time, consume your energy, that you try to coach uh, somehow to make them build and they always broke and they, they just like, they are toxic for you. You need to cut relation. You need to just block people. Use blocking buttons on whatsapp blocking buttons on facebook it's sad but sometimes you don't have choice people who, who are too much toxic for you you need to block them you need to you cannot you cannot just like try infinite time you can try a few times if you love someone but you cannot just keep always uh, people around you that are toxic you you will become for yourself toxic we are the sum of the five persons we we spend the most time with so be around people that are very um, fulfilling you but in a good way and also people that inspire you and also don't be the best in the room always try to have some better poker player with you when you hang out with poker player because okay being the best in the room is cool because the people will will always uh, be nice to you because they know you are like better than them they will learn from you blah 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 so they want to hang out with you but when you are not the best and there are some people better than you around you then um, it's you are reconsidering uh, sometimes what you do. You, you d discover some mistake that you do and you are evolving. You're starting evolving in those, point, in those moments, not when you are like the best in the room. You are starting evolving where, when you are like one of the worst in the room. And that's actually what I put myself in challenge. It's really hardcore challenge, especially when you don't have a routine uh, that is really... Um, um, you don't have a lot of... Uh, if you don't have a lot of those discipline or a lot of... Uh, boundaries or you don't have like uh, relations and stuff you, you you can become mad if you arrive in an atmosphere like high rollers where people are so good uh, technically in poker and you feel that you have so much to learn from them you need to have like solid life uh, 
around solid finance, solid everything, if you want to succeed, because it will be so hard. Or I could stay in my comfort zone and be like the number one uh, French coach, number one French player, blah, 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 and just staying on my stuff and not even trying to fight with, uh, with those guys in high rollers. Uh, but I give a try and... Uh, because I have, I think I have solid uh, routine, solid discipline. I can increase them, and I'm giving a try now, and it's very interesting. And I'm learning. At least I'm learning. Even if I lose, I'm gonna learn. For now, I'm winning. Let's yeah. let's see what is gonna happen in the future. Yeah, great stuff. So yeah, I think what you were saying there was cultivate the right people around you. Almost like invest in the right people, your friends, your good relationships, but at the same time, cut out the toxic people because you haven't got the the time, the energy, the bandwidth to uh, have that many people around you. So uh, pick your circle wisely. Also have people around you who are better than you and what you do, who inspire you, who you look up to, so you're learning from. Almost like if you're the average of the five people around you, you want two two above, one on your level, two below. And that kind of yeah, ratio. I think it's, your, a, I think it's yeah. a good balance, yeah. When you have yeah. four above you, it's a, it beca- it start becoming a problem also, but most of the time people do the mistake to have four people under under them because it's way more comfortable. Um, yeah, it's it's a good balance what you say two two and one uh, same. Because one same can be your best friend, can be somehow like one of your best friend. Two that you get inspired that are like your mentors kind of. Plus they need to be your friends if you want to hang out with them, or you need to pay them to hang out a lot with them, like pay them at uh, hourly coaching. To, to not to hang out, but just to learn from them as coaching. It's also time, um, even if it's time paid, it's, it's, it's still, uh, it, it still counts. Uh, if you have a lot of coaching with them, then it, it, it's still a lot of time. Uh, and two above you, uh, under you, sorry, can be like just slightly under you, not maybe too much under you. Maybe one is like one, one of the guy you coach and you help uh, accomplishing. Maybe not too many of them, because if you have too many of them, then you, you, you start dedicating too much time to coaching and, and, and you cannot improve as much uh, like that. But one is it's, it's, it's decent and one other can be just another friend that is just less successful and whatever it is, it's just one other good friend you can relate with. It can be also your partner, one girl, whatever. Um, that sounds like a decent, uh, decent scenario. Um, yeah, thinking about more, yeah, thinking about our relationship like an asset, this is key. Um, yeah, and definitely this will help your game to be well, well, well better and your burnouts to be less cost. Uh, they, they will cost less. Your burnouts will cost well less and you will have burnouts no matter what in poker. Love it. I love this advice. I really feel like it's a, an angle I didn't expect this conversation to go down. I think it's just such a powerful model for people to listen to and really reflect on their relationships and how they're showing up in them. And I think it all links back to like the way you're, you show up in life is the same way you show up in your relationships. Like you were talking earlier about bringing the fun to poker games. It's your responsibility to be the enjoyment for the room. It's the same with your relationships. It's, it's your responsibility to show up, to be the fun person, to be the, the good friend in those dynamics. And it doesn't often come easy. And often we have to invest time and energy into those things. And yeah, I think like we, we talked about earlier, often poker players do the opposite. They just go, relationships, go that way. I'm going to be successful, make loads of money, and then I'll figure it out. So yeah, I really feel like to be a more balanced person, like you said, less burnouts, to be a higher performer, combining the two, having good relationships with a successful career is the model almost everyone wants. So we need to be thinking about that and cultivating it during the journey, not at the end. So yeah, amazing stuff. And yeah, I think we could go forever on this because I think it's so, so powerful. All right, Rene, have you got any uh, final questions? Any other things that haven't come up yet? No, I think uh, I think we've uh, asked everything we wanted to ask. Is there something that you still want to share, uh, Johan, to our listeners? Something that you still want to say that we haven't brought up? No, I think we covered uh, all the subjects. Uh, yeah, the, 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 again, the key uh, for me, uh, it's always about... Uh, mental stuff and how you uh, you organize your whole life, the macro, the mental stuff, and just start to um, estimate those things as much as you estimate working on uh, on the micro, which is whatever solvers and, and uh, other like coaching analyze stuff that you that you do. Just start evaluating your the macro as something way more like at least as important as the micro, but way more. People do the opposite. They they will they will work a lot on their micro, but they have poor 
poor macro and end up to be also poor life and unsatisfied, frustrated, because also they don't ask themselves those questions too much and they realize when it's too late that when it's too late, when it's late, that they are not happy and that it's not key. And in any case, all the effort that you're gonna do in micro that will make you more wealthy, more rich, more blah, 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 will be, will be lost because you will not be happy and because your macro will make you burn out. Your macro is so bad that you will burn out in any case and, and lose somehow because in poker, we, we are playing with our money. So we are also playing when we, are not, when we are not happy, when we are not in good condition. So it can be really dangerous. It can be really dangerous for any point of your career. So it's also a uh, note for myself. I will, you can go crazy and start playing all the high rollers, playing 250K, rebuying, blah, 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 blah. You can go broke. Like there is no point where someone cannot go broke in poker. Like the only moment where you cannot go broke anymore in poker is when you are a billionaire. And even if you are a billionaire, to be honest, there are some games where you could, you could lose a lot. You can lose a lot, especially if you are like way behind the, the, the average level of the game. Um, so yeah, let's say that you can lose a lot, but you will never like make yourself in danger when you are a billionaire. But I think no one of us is billionaire. Not a lot of people that listen to this podcast now are billionaires. And maybe one day someone will be, and I hope <laughs> someone that listen to that will be and, and just come to me and say, okay, I liked what you said. And, uh, you know, I did that, that, and that. And I'm like way more rich than you now and uh, whatever. And uh, I'm, I will be like, wow, this is insane. And I will try to learn from what I didn't um, get, uh, that he got that I didn't get. You know, I would try to always understand what what someone got that I didn't get um yeah because we can be smart in some areas and completely dumb in other I'm very dumb in many areas so it's important to, to realize it's, it's good it's good self-awareness yeah, yeah super important because you cannot evolve if you think you are the smartest in the room in all areas like you're just gonna you're just gonna stay the same and even regress Yeah, I mean, you you talked about you know yeah you can keep on firing this 250k. You are currently in the high roller scene, right? Taking some shots there. Uh, what is the biggest threat for you then, in terms of you said everyone can broke, anyone can go broke. What would be the biggest threat for you in going broke? No, in the, the, high the, the 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 biggest threat. No, I will. I I never put myself in in danger. So I will. I, I'm not threatened by anything. I just. I just. I just always keep reminding myself that we need to take a decision that are always part of a macro uh, organization. Like bank roll management is key for poker. Shorting is not a way. I don't short actually. It's like part of my bank roll management. I'm not shorting those things. Uh, I'm just know that I'm giving. Uh, tries and I also know uh, also being why okay my biggest threat will be like thinking maybe that I'm too good compared to what I am actually I am actually so and also thinking that I'm too bad compared to what I am so the most uh, difficult is to evaluate our own level compared to other people because of the big variance that there is in life so the 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 The, the most difficult is to not think that you are too good compared to the other people. So to underestimate them and thinking you are way, way too over them or the opposite. If you think you are too bad compared to them, then you're going to play bad also because yeah, you, you won't even enter probably. Yeah. So you need to think, try to, yeah, try to become better, but also think uh, the most objective possible about your level which is very difficult in live games. It's more easy online. So maybe one yeah, of the keys the is to continue to play online. One of the yeah. keys maybe to continue to play online, but I would not be willing to do so, um, to be honest. not uh, It's not fulfilled me uh, enough. Uh, I also think there is cheating going on and not everywhere, but I think there is. Um, so I, I don't, I don't definitely don't want to, 
to be part of it anymore. Uh, the games are also quite really... low, right, for your standards now. What do you mean? The, the, ga of... the games. The games yeah, are quite big low on now online. You can play super big, bro. You can play. Uh, you can play like session on Sundays. Uh, like tournaments, guys, they play a uh, two hundred k session on Sundays. They have like okay. spending two hundred k. So it's uh, if they if they make zero in the money, they they lose two hundred k. Yeah, okay, no, that's, that's not big. low. You can play quite big nowadays uh, because there is bunch of IRLs, rebuys, and also in cash game. If you manage to mm -hmm. go in high stakes, you can like there is some some games. If you manage to battle with some regs, then you can you can start some games online that are like uh, 100, 200, even more. Some people had one million on the table uh, recently. But yeah, it so. often. yeah, I know the guy. Uh, but yeah, so so, this, so 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 this is not in your career path. We won't see you. Uh, no, we see, won't no, see you no, at no, those no. games. Definitely right. not. And uh, it took me time to accept that because I I always wanted to do both. But one day I decided, I said like I'm not having fun anymore. I'm not having like uh, um, it's not social like I, it's not the, the 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 poker that I want to play anymore. You know, I played all the years. I also think it's way more difficult than before. It doesn't think it's impossible at all. Because like so many people are making good money online, so many good players. But I also think it's both more difficult plus less fun for someone that gets older. I think uh, I'm 33 now. I'm more like a lifestyle, and I always loved live. Remember, I start with live. I didn't start with online. I'm I'm someone that is social. Online is the opposite of my uh, character. So, but one of the key probably. Uh, for the thing that I said before is to keep playing online because uh, you can realize your, uh, you can know better what is your level, what is your poker level. Yeah. And you can be a bit less lost when you're going to choose your live games, you know, which is more difficult for me nowadays because I cannot see exactly where I am in the field um, many times in many games. But I keep giving tries, you know, I, I prefer to, to give tries. I always not take i'm not taking big risk so there is no big threat but the, if i have to say a bigger threat that's what I, I would have said is to not be able to judicate my own level compared to the field that would be my biggest threat and your and your management and your self-awareness is way greater than your ego because i would say an ego is often a very big threat right in poker yeah oh i guess it was my biggest threat at the beginning that one but uh, then, yeah, of course, I worked on it with uh, with twelve years of poker. You you cannot have like too much ego. I have ego, but uh, yeah, yeah, like everyone. you you remove it, like you you remove it on many situations and stuff. Mm. All right. Well, I want to thank you a lot, Johan, for sharing a lot of wisdom, uh, and I want to wish you a lot of luck. You're heading over to uh, EPT Monte Carlo tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. yeah. Mm -hmm. busy yeah. schedule there. Busy schedule, yeah, yeah. I'm, I might play the 100k euro uh, on Sunday. Yeah, it's a right, three well, days event. Yeah. Well, I wish you a lot of luck. You're in a good state, right? You've you've socialized. Relationship are good. Happy. You're feeling excited. I see a lot of good things going to happen for you in Monte Carlo. What about you, Adam? I do. I think the macro strategy is spot on. I think the micro is going in there strong as well. And yeah. You put yourself in a good position to uh, have a good 10 days. If I so. win something big in Monte Carlo, guys, I will uh, I will say something in the story for you guys, for sharing oh. the, the good vibes, sharing the good, the good vibes. positivity. <laughs> yeah. yeah, amazing. I will Look definitely up. think about those conversations. This was great conversation, okay? I liked it. Yes, All right, thank I think you it's a important lot. to have those conversations with smart people because when you have those conversations, you also... Uh, you you anchor in yourself the concepts because it's easy to have the concept. It's another thing to apply them. So when you anchor them, the more you anchor them, the more you apply them because you cannot just speak for nothing. So you just like speak, 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 speak. But as 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 much as you repeat the things and the concept, you 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 apply them more. You apply them more unconsciously, consciously, and everything. So very important that we repeat the concept. Some concept we know already. Some concepts come from when you associate people that have different, that are smart, that are different uh, way to think. Then you, it creates another concept that we didn't uh, got before, just because of exchanging, you know. And I think in this conversation there was some concept that that were born, that that got born because we 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 ask ourselves different questions. 
you, me, and, and René, like all three, like this, you know, as a ping pong. Another wisdom bomb dropped in the Mechanics of Poker podcast. Right, Adam? Yes, that was an amazing episode. Probably our most charismatic guest to date. And yeah, just knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb. My, I've run out of paper. I literally ran out of paper for my note taking. So I'm going to have to uh, uh, reflect on the main points I got from it. See, I think one of the themes that was going throughout the conversation, which we didn't go into in depth, was his level of self-awareness and his intuition as well. He's very aware of his current skill level, his faults, his ego even early in his career. He realized that was an issue. And he seems like someone who's very in tune with his intuition. He's very in tune with his environment. I think he said the biggest life lesson he learned from poker overall was his ability to read people, not just poker players, but people, anyone in a circle. So that requires a lot of intuition, a lot of feel for your environment, a lot of emotional regulation skills, but yeah, emotional intelligence as well to do that. But yeah, I think that's a real high level skill that he's been able to develop. One of the biggest things I took away from this conversation was treating your relationships as an asset. And he used this concept of micro and macro throughout it. There's many examples, micro being the kind of in, in, like in, the, in the weeds strategy, like the, the short term, but the macro is kind of the bigger picture. I think that really matters in the long term. And he talked about his relationships and basically how he invests in those as an investment because his long term, like the macro strategy of being happy is one of the most important things to him. And that translates to him being a good poker player, performing well. And then the micro of that is his mood equals EV, so to speak. He didn't use that terminology, but he's comparing when he's in a negative frame of mind, he loses money or he doesn't play his best. When he's feeling good and feeling happy, he plays his best poker. And he's always thinking big picture. He's someone who, uh, I think I, I mentioned this through the, the, uh, the podcast, he's almost like a, a chess player, which he was when he was younger. And he's navigating his life circumstances and trying to optimize for happiness, trying to optimize for the bigger picture. And yeah, I think the way he was talking about putting time into your relationships. That was his personal relationships, his poker friends, and in particular, his outside of poker friends. He, he took a bit of time explaining why it's so important as poker players to really reach out to our friends outside of poker and really nurture those relationships. And then going away from this conversation, I'm literally going to message a few friends because I feel like I've been neglecting this part of my life and I'm really big on his macro strategy of relationships equal happiness equals a good life. So yeah, there's so many concepts that we that he dove deep into. And yeah, very, very impressed with his ability to uh, share knowledge, share wisdom. And yeah, he's picked up a lot of skills and hopefully the way he was relaying the points would resonate with our audience as much as it has with me because I think I'm going to go away from this and journal and reflect because yeah, very, very yeah, in-depth knowledge that he had there. So yeah, what were some of your main takeaways, Randy? Any, any concepts that stuck with you? Yeah, and especially I felt like this podcast was really different than the other ones. There was a lot of different angles being, you know, called that in the previous podcast, we haven't heard a guest talk about in this way, right? Normally there's sort of a trend and the podcast sort of kind of, you know, they're the same type of players. Uh, but Johan definitely brought something new to the table. So I think that's that's very nice. And indeed, the whole macro-micro concept that kept on coming back, I loved the thing where he said, yeah, you can focus on the micro and play well on the live, on the live table. You have a good hourly. But if they don't like to play with you, if you're not entertaining, the macro is that you can play a lot of hours. If you only focus on the micro, you can maybe play two hours and the game dies. But the macro is your job is to keep that game alive so you can realize your hourly. So I thought that was... Uh, that was really interesting. I played, uh, he, has a, he has a game here and I got invited to that game a couple of times. And this was actually, he also said, this is something you do well uh, because I go into the game thinking like, okay, yeah, uh, I, want to, I want to have a good time when I go play live. I want to have a good time. And I'm sure also they want to have a good time. And they, if they like to play with me and I like to play with them, we can play again, right? I thought about in the macro level as well. Um, I also thought it was indeed interesting what you said, be happy, basically because of that, he plays his A game more often. And, you know, I think everyone listening, if you play your A game, you're a good winning player, right? So if I think he finds ways around the macro in order to play his A game more frequently. Uh, also thought it was interesting that a big tell when he's not happy is that he spews. It's almost like a self-sabotage. Like your body is saying, okay, fuck this. I'm going to spew it off right now because I do not do not want to be here, okay? It's just a, just a clear warning sign. So I thought that was very valuable as well. And I mean, we can go on and on and on. That's why we talked for, what, two and a half hours or something with Johan. So I want to thank him again. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in uh, to another great podcast. We actually are going to record another podcast tomorrow. Right, Adam? I'll see you tomorrow morning again. 
for yeah. for the for the listener, they'll be like, okay, is it coming out the next day as well? No, you will have to wait probably two weeks in between. So thank you all for tuning in again. Make sure to like, subscribe, you name it, give a good rating, and check in the, all the socials for the new episode. And uh, yeah, that's it. Now, if you learned something in this episode, we would much appreciate it if you like and subscribe. Leave a comment with your main takeaways. Give us a five-star rating and follow the pod. This way we can reach more players and help them reach their big and ambitious poker goals. And if you want us to help you get to those goals, go over to pokerambition.com to find out more. 